Radiotheatrecritic.com. Welcome, travelers, to the fringes of reality, where the strange and mysterious meet, and the thin veil between fact and fiction is torn. Welcome to the Forbidden Frontier. You're the Mormons. We hear you, the Mormons. We hear you guys out there. Here you out there. I'll come from Utah. It's weird. <laughs> Just but one I'll direction. I, I hear I'll one applause. guy. I hear one I'll guy in Australia ready. going. <laughs> <laughs> and Utah's like, yeah! <laughs> uh, a little information about me personally. Uh, I am not Mormon, but mm. my sperm donor father, who left my sixteen-year-old mother. Uh, was oh. really uh, yeah, not a very good That's one not, actually. Not, but, you know, it doesn't seem like a good moment of them. You know, die. great way to start. <laughs> so you're you're kind of half Mormon, basically. Yeah, like oh, yeah. Like right. I mean, yeah, <laughs> half Mormon. Sure. Okay. Sure. All right. I'll be, I'll be here to teach you about your heritage, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he obviously didn't like me and went off and started another family. And I probably have like 15 half brothers and sisters out there somewhere. Yeah. Well, we are known for having lots of wives. So, you know, yeah, hey, hey. a lot of moms, a lot of, a lot of step moms. What would, what would it be? I, sister moms, sister wives, sister, wives. Sister, sister moms. Yeah. yeah. Wait, that sounds weird. Hey, that's Alabama. That weird. Okay. That's uh, like, <laughs> I just We're gonna talk about Jeremy here. Oh, Different area know. of the country. I just didn't know he was book. Mormon. Here's an interesting fact because we we Mormons, Latter Day Saint people, we get a lot of flack for the whole polygamy thing, right? Mm -hmm. You know, during the time when Mormons practice polygamy because we don't anymore, like on a percentage basis, there like overall amounts of people in America that was practicing polygamy was actually a higher percentage than Mormons who practiced it at the time. Um, really? Huh. Were, yep. Yep. Well, they still yeah, practice it in all kinds of places in the world. Yeah. Well, exactly. Exactly. Um, this isn't just a, a Mormon thing. Polygamy, it's still being practiced, not by us. And, uh, yeah, it was uh, far it more common back then. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Just too much work. <laughs> Good God. You, you know what? Do you get sick or or a lot of Mormons get sick of that stereotype of the, like, the whole polygamous thing? I mean, it's pretty easy to address. Uh, yeah. Because, like, that's what that statistic right there is like well mm. you know most oh not most but a lot of people were doing it back then even more yeah. than us and uh we discontinue the practice though, though this is the interesting thing like if people want to come at that from a um a religious standpoint it's like hang on you do realize that a like jacob Abraham, Moses. People don't realize Moses had more, more than one wife, right? And these are some these are exalted prophets. Like Jesus even said that Abraham so they went to a mountain, mm -hmm. yeah, like on the right hand of God. Okay, <laughs> I gotta get, like, I gotta get somewhere I can hear myself yes. think. Yes. <laughs> Need some air, right? And so, from a religious perspective, if someone if there is a, a Christian church claiming to be the true mm. church of Jesus Christ on earth, they need there has to be a doctrine that explains that practice um, somewhere because clearly there is a provision uh, that you know God was seemingly okay with because Moses, Abraham, Jacob, and stuff, uh, and so. Uh, yeah, they, like there needs to actually be a doctrine to explain it. Listen, listen, Adam's got many ribs, okay? <laughs> Look, just grab a couple more, just, you know? <laughs> yeah, just, what's another rib or two? There you go. Yeah. <clears throat> Funny that we, we started off with that one. Polygamy! Yeah, yeah, right off the top. Just ripping well, it off like a band-aid. Be fruitful and multiply. Well, 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 Gary, 
that might be what some of the where the doctrine comes from. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. so it's, that would make sense. The Book of Mormon actually has a um, a scripture which uh, explains this. People people don't really realize this, but um, uh, let me let me see if I can look it up. I got my I got my Book of Mormon right here. Um, da -da -da -da. Jacob, prophets worshiping pure in heart. Okay, okay. All right, so the Nephites, right? The Nephites, they're, um, uh, I'll, I'll give you the background of where the Nephites come from and everything like that. Uh, but there's a group amongst the Nephites that uh, started having more than one wives and started getting concubines because they re were reading, you know, uh, Old Testament. They uh, they brought the Old Testament with them, which is like the four books of Moses, Isaiah and stuff. Um, and uh, they're reading, oh, oh, look at this, King David, he had concubines and uh, and Moses and everything. And so they started to practice it. And, and the prophet, whose name was Jacob, he was like, no, 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 this, this is not, this is not it, guys. And uh, and so he does a sermon to them, telling them to shape up. And he says, uh, and this is from Jacob, and this is in Jacob chapter 2, verses 28. For I, the Lord God, delight in the chastity of women, and whoredoms are an abomination before me, thus saith the Lord of hosts. Wherefore, this people shall keep my commandments, saith the Lord of hosts, or cursed be the land for their sake. For if I will, saith the Lord of hosts, raise up seed unto me, I will command my people. Otherwise, they shall hearken unto these things. And so that's saying the law of chastity is straight. One man, one woman, it. Mm -hmm. But if there is an instance where he wants to raise up seed, right, where the, the 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 strongest way to grow his covenant people on earth is through birth instead of conversion, he will command otherwise for a short instance and then revoke it when it's done. Hmm. And, uh, and so, so I'm just trying to, to sow my fields. All right. Look, <laughs> listen, wife. All right. I got to God told me to go sow the fields. Um. <clears throat> got to plant my seed. Yeah, I can also it. say I, like I, other I, things of, of David was not good. You know, he, he yes, coveted yeah, other people's yeah. wives and mm. sent mm. them to the front lines to get them killed and all kinds of stuff. I think that's yeah. like the main story of the Bible is bad people being used for good because yeah. humans are bad. I actually, I think I missed the scripture where he literally says one man and one woman, but there's a point who is like, you know, yeah, stop having more than one wife. Basically, and, <laughs> stop doing um, that. Yeah, stop doing so that. So um, how, how much... Uh, similarities and differences are there between the Bible and the Book of Mormon? Like, are uh, they based on the same kind of stories? I'm coming from a place of, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. nothing about the Mormon religion mm -hmm. at all. Yeah. So the background is uh, the Book of Mormon it starts with uh, an account of a uh, family that lived in Jerusalem. Uh, they're technically not Jews. They are actually descendants of Joseph. Um, but this was before the Babylonian captivity. And so before a lot of Israel was taken off and, and scattered, um, uh, well, even though there was a North and South Kingdom. But anyway, so what happens is that there were, this is the time of Jeremiah. And in, in Jeremiah, it says there were many prophets in the land. One of those prophets, this is the account of one of those prophets in his family. His name is Lehi. And Lehi has been preaching repentance to the people in Jerusalem. They're rejecting him. And he gets a vision saying, Jerusalem is going to be destroyed, which it was. This was but pre the Babylonian captivity. And he is commanded, take your family and flee, flee Jerusalem because everyone's going to be wiped out. And so the first book of Nephi gives the account of them leaving Jerusalem um, and uh, building a boat and being taken to the promised land. Uh, as guided by God. And the principal person who's really following is the son of Lehi, which is, his name is Nephi. And Nephi becomes the first major prophet in the Book of Mormon. And then the Book of Mormon follows the account of their descendants on the promised land, which is the American continent, covers a thousand years until the entire Nephite people are wiped out and destroyed. And uh, the, they kept meticulous records throughout the entire time. And there were heaps of these records uh, and and uh, it, with all these different prophets. Yo, Garrett. So the Nephites are not Native Americans, as we see, as we think of Native Americans today. They were a, well, they were a civilization before the Native Americans that got wiped out. 
it gets a little so what happens is when they land on the american continent there's a schism in their family the two eldest sons layman and lemuel want felt that they deserve to lead um this colony essentially after lehi dies and they decide to try and kill nephi and anyone who's following nephi nephi gets warned and he has to flee with his family and they they leave and they settle in a land called nephi uh, and so they uh, end up becoming two separate people, the Nephites and the Lamanites. And uh, the Nephites end up getting wiped out. But the Lamanites, uh, there are indications um, in the Book of Mormon quite extensively that the Lamanites, the, the side that branches off, basically end up marrying and mixing and joining with the native inhabitants that were already there in America at the time. And there are a lot what year, of indications. What year is this? What, what year was this? 600 BC oh. is when they came to the Americas. Yes. The yes. first time. Okay. Yeah. And there is okay. a lot of indications in the Book of Mormon that there are people already. In fact, there, there are there are two specific direct accounts of in the Book of Mormon uh, that where the Nephites come across other people that were already there. There's the Mulekites. Okay. Um, the Mulekites are actually people who also left Jerusalem and they only come across them like hundreds of years later. And then they come across uh, a wiped out kingdom that were descendants of people that left from the Tower of Babel called the Jaredites. And they came to the American continent thousands of years ago. Thousands of years ago. Thousands and of years before 800 BC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're like way, okay. way, and, and it seems like a lot of the population, well, well, this, like, because the Book of Mormon basically says there were other people who were coming to the American continent, and it actually mentions two. But that also brings the uh, sense of precedent that there were other people coming to this country. They're not the only ones. Yeah, they're not the only ones. And it's really like there are so many points where the Book of Mormon is indicating that there are other people and that the Lamanites, the Laman and Lamu, they ended up mixing with them quite a lot, especially if you follow the pop the population. Because the in Jacob, the section that I just read from, he see there's a part where he comes out and says, Look, there are so many names. There are Nephites, there are Amulites, there are these lights, there's these lights. And then he says, There are Lamanites, there are and then it's like, look, look, clear this up, to clear this up so it's just easier to write down. Everyone who is a friend to Nephi, I'm calling Nephites, and everyone who wants to destroy ne the Nephites, I'm calling Lamanites. And that is the standard that the Book of Mormon then defines throughout the rest of the Book of Mormon. And so there are a lot of um, tribes and civilizations that the Book of Mormon is referring to as Lamanites, which very much seem to be uh, native inhabitants that uh, either mixed with Lamanites or already there. And uh, and there's all these interesting indications. Um, but to answer your question, we do believe that there are still descendants uh, that have the blood of uh, Nephi and Lehi uh, in the American continent. And more specifically, uh, Central America seems to be where a lot of this archaeological uh, indications and evidence are rising about this stuff that blows my friggin' mind, guys. Uh, like it's, it's pretty crazy stuff. And a lot of it uh, pops up. Uh, around Central America. So we're looking at the Hopewell Indians. The Hopewell Indians are known as the Mound Builders uh, and also Cherokee Indians and stuff like that, the, the Central American kind of Indian groups. Um, and So uh, not, we'll not Central, all... Central United States. Yes. By the way. Yeah, that's so, not, so not all Native know. American tribes are considered to be a part of, like this descendant from Jerusalem. No. Just yes. Yeah. Parts of it. Okay. Um, exactly. Exactly. I watched that video. Oh, hey. Oh, I watched the video you sent. Yeah, so uh, what, what, what we are finding out unrelated in, in uh, South, Central America and South, well, mostly South America, right? Peru. Um, our boy Brian Forster did the DNA on those elongated skulls, remember? And uh, one of the results didn't come back good, but one of the results, the Canadian results that came in, uh, had it, correct me if I'm wrong, chat, it's, some, it's, it's around Turkey basically where really where some of the da yeah the black sea and and turkey mm -hmm. were were some of the uh dna came from and then one thing we absolutely know that science has now confirmed that there's aboriginal dna in the middle of the amazon rainforest <laughs> really that, Which is that wild. goes back twelve thousand years so That's how funny. in the buck did they get there uh, it goes back further, um, and it's just a certain group. It's a group. It's a like a cluster in the in the Amazon rainforest, not outside it, not up here mm -hmm. in the states. Wow. So they're starting to find that DNA. 
Um, yeah. There were like rumors a long time ago of uh, they were in South Dakota, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong again, Jack. I'm going back on, on so many memories here of uh, fair looking uh, indigenous people that they ran across. Like they were, mm -hmm. they were fair looking. So mm -hmm. could they be, you know, could they be, was it neophytes or Vikings? Who fucking knows? Who knows? Mm -hmm. But um, hey, so on the note how... of the DNA. Sorry, Garrett. No, I was, I was going to go and say so that's how the the golden tablets made it to america was through these people that moved from jerusalem here so the the golden plates was the abridged uh, record because they kept like i said meticulous records they had a mm -hmm. thousand years and there was way too much to fit into one book and so the last prophet amongst the nephites actually led the nephites in battle against the lamanites seeing his people get totally wiped out um he he uh, his name was mormon and Mormon abridged all those records, condensed them, put them into one book. And th those are the gold plates. And those are the plates that he buried that Joseph Smith was guided to um, and translated. Uh, but to jump on the whole thing, Gary, you're mentioning DNA, because DNA has been an interesting debate controversy uh, in regards to the Book of Mormon and stuff. And what's, this stuff is really, really, in, only like the last five, ten years or so, they found a DNA strain amongst the uh, um, uh, Central American Indians, like the Hopewell Indian descendants and, and Cherokee and stuff, that um, it's and they're like these four haplo groups, and they found a new one called haplo group X, which is the same DNA marker that modern day Jews have, and and dates Ooh. to uh, right now. This mm. is the controversy about it because they uh, try to then date how old is this genetic marker, this haplo group X, and. Uh, there are two types of dating um, genetic kind of mutation over time. And one is called phylogenetic dating and the other is called pedigree dating. Under phylogenetic dating, this, um, uh, this uh, uh, DNA marker, this haplogroup X, dates back thousands and thousands of years. We're talking about like uh, even predating Book of Mormon times, right? But under the pedigree dating method, it lands smack dab exactly when the Nephites land on the Americas. American continent. Um, but the thing BC. is, 600 BC, yeah. Oh, and, 600, uh, right, right. 600. But there is current debate. It was, this was actually in like the Journal of Science, I think it's called. Uh, where did I have it here? The Journal of, Journal of Science as to which dating method they should use because the problem with the difference between phylogenetic dating and pedigree dating, they give vastly, I mean, vastly different time scales and they do not match up at all. And so they're trying to figure out which one is more valid. Um, and for your information, pedigree dating <clears throat> takes um, a, a grandmother, uh, their daughter and granddaughter, right? Uh, takes each of their DNA and measures if there's any change in that DNA over those three generations. And most of the time, it's not, right? It's only like 1% um, uh, of the time to actually see a, a difference uh, over that that time frame. But when you take like uh, 10,000 groups of grandmother, mother and daughter, and then you can say, find how many times there is a, a, a mutation in that, that gives them a scale as to how regularly um, it's, it's mitochondri mitochondrial DNA mutation happens um, over generations. And when they do that, it actually ends up being um, like 10 times faster the, than the phylogenetic dating method. And so they can't really marry up that up how how it, it's fast and different because one of the <laughs> one of the crazy things about the pedigree dating right, um, if they use that which is the, is a, an observable rate you can observe that in current kind of you know generations right, it it then indicates that the most common maternal ancestor of the human race dates to six thousand years ago, and so they get hmm. they get thrown out a bit by that. Um, so that's I mean, just an isn't, interesting tidbit. I, I, that just makes me think of you know creationists. Or that's the, the young earth. earth. That's the right. young. They earth they, be, they believe that that's when it all snapped yeah. into existence. And, and for me, by the way, I could go either way. I I, I, I to both theories. If um humans have been around for millions of years, or or if it's the creation things. Actually, I feel both fit in scripturally, and uh, I don't have too much issue with it. But it, um. Mm. Because well, well, that's if you that's if you consider that evolution was one of the mechanics that God used for the creation of humans, but predating Adam, um, mm -hmm. and uh, and then it fits in quite quite well uh, from a religious standpoint. But uh, anyway, that was that was an aside, just on the whole DNA thing. There's some real fascinating stuff. 
Well, the video that was sent uh, shows artifacts that, I mean, th they go over it extensively and uh, even BYU and the Smithsonian say they're mm -hmm. fake. Um, w there was a couple of interesting ones that we could go over, especially the one yeah. that they demand that they show upside down exactly the um, bad creek state hmm? i find because that is the most compelling one um yeah. that there's a contradicts lot the claims of of being falsified because the there creek are state. there are fakes but there's mm -hmm. stuff that's not so fake that looks like cuneiform there is mm -hmm. the the pot that they the bowl that they found the magna fuente bowl mm -hmm. that they found in south america that basically looks fucking you know uh sumerian uh because it yeah. is it's got two forms of it by the way um there is there's they found uh uh basically runes here like lots of runes lots what? of runes lots I, I, and lots of runes the best runes <laughs> the perfect frankly, runes. Frankly. uh and I, um yeah the, the, and there's lots of lore going back uh, again th this goes this is not every culture or every tribe has some kind of uh like god not not god but civilization creator the guy who came comes in usually has a beard uh when they don't have beards and mm -hmm. said hey i'm gonna teach you how to make cities and cheeseburgers and you know yeah, and happen uh, to have a bag animal husbandry not wifery husbandry and uh yeah had a little bag have a little handbag so there's yeah. a lot of that going going along so uh, I thought it was interesting that they, they found a lot of artifacts. They kind of poo-pooed them. I wasn't sure about some of them, but mm -hmm. the one with the, the, uh, Oh, another thing I want to preface is Graham Hancock in America before in the beginning of the book. So this video you sent me basically is about how the Hebrew, how there's a lot of Hebrew things in, uh, in native American culture, just, you know, some little things here and there that, that are, that are, similar well in graham hancock's book just to show like we want it like it's not just hebrew there's a uh, couple of of uh i believe it's the mississippi it's a it's a it's a tribe that's already gone that was in the mississippi valley that basically practices the same religion as the ancient egyptians did Mm -hmm. I mean, it's essentially mm. the same thing. Like the afterlife, you go through like Orion, and you have to walk the, the way to the way. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So uh, oh, okay, it, yeah. So it's, yeah, it's it's, it's very clear thing. we're connected way more than we thought we yeah. were. There's a well, lot of examples of that. On the Egyptian thing, this might be a good springboard um, for some interesting, uh, in really interesting stuff about the Book of Mormon. So. The Book of Mormon is uh, an anomaly for a lot of uh, people who want to try and criticize it, because when you actually try and dive into the, uh, you know, authenticity of the text and the fact that this book claims to be um, an ancient record, right? And you want to, and then they try and break down, okay, if it was, uh, it's technically in the Hebrew language, but uh, but it was written in Reformed Egyptian. And uh, they try and, and break this down and they run into some really compelling stuff that stumps a lot of people because one of the things that you need to understand to try and frame uh this discussion is the historical accounts <clears throat> which confirm a lot of um the uh record of how the book of mormon came to be that it was written within a 60-day period right the education that joseph smith had prior to this because joseph smith he he worked he had to you know support himself and so there were employees there were people completely outside of you know the religious stuff that saw a lot of what he was doing and can confirm yeah he was there claiming to do this at this time mm -hmm. uh there, there it was known that you know he, he supposedly had golden plates and so people were trying to steal the gold plates from him and uh, there are uh, there are witnesses who he showed the golden plates to that handled him with like oh, this is gold this is mm -hmm. like we're looking at these are ancient characters and they signed a thing saying yes, oh the, the, the three witnesses plates. well no these are the are you talking witnesses. about more than that more than that. Okay. More than that. So at the at the beginning of the Book of Mormon, you'll find um, two uh, testimonies. One is the one is the testimony of the three witnesses, and then the testimony of the eight witnesses underneath okay. here. And so a lot of these witnesses, by the way, ended up having a falling out with Joseph Smith, and uh, and uh, not supporting him, leaving the church. Right. And even after they had this falling out with Joseph Smith, they never denied the testimony that they signed. They said, no, no, no. Like like I don't like Joseph Smith. But this was real. This happened. 
um, and the golden plates are real. And so one of the other things that's confirmed about this is Joseph Smith had no formal education. OK, and it seems like he, like he was the translator and he had people who dictated for him as he was reading out the translation. And one was his wife, Emma. There was Oliver Cowdery. And so there's only a handful of people, like a small group of people that were actually actively had a role in when the Book of Mormon was being written. And the period falls to 60, a 60 day period in which the entire book was written, which is already bonkers considering the length and complexity of this. OK, Um and then the education that Joseph Smith had. He didn't have an education. Like, listen listen to this account from his wife. And this is confirmed by people who knew him, people who have read his um, stuff and, uh, and stuff. So she says this. Uh, Joseph could neither write nor dictate a coherent, well-worded letter, let alone dictate a book like the Book of Mormon. The larger part of his labor of translation was done in my presence where I could see and know what was being done. During no part of it did Joseph Smith have any manuscript or book of any kind from which to read or dictate except the metallic plates which I knew he had. Uh, if, she said, um, <clears throat> he had anything of that kind that he could have... He could have not concealed it from me. She's saying no other books to reference, no other information about Hebrew culture, history, name places or anything like that. Uh, and she added, writing to her son, I'm satisfied that no man could have dictated the writing of the manuscript unless he was inspired. For when acting as a scribe, your father would dictate to me hour after hour. And when returning after meals or after interruptions, he would at once begin where he had left off without either seeing the manuscript, which is the, the part that she was dictating, or having any portion of it read back to him. This was a usual thing for him to do. It would have been improbable that a learned man could do this. And for one so ignorant and unlearned as he was, it was simply impossible. And wow. like I said, th that account of his education is confirmed by people who knew him that were outside of the church. So now we come to some really interesting stuff. The first interesting stuff, right? If this was a fraud, if someone was wanting to make, you know, a book of scripture that had an account of an ancient people, there are some really weird things that they choose. For instance, we've just talked about how the Nephites came from, um, uh, uh, you know, Jerusalem. And so they spoke Hebrew. So when they're writing a, 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 an account of their of their people and record, what language do you think that they would write in? Just uh, throwing that out there to you guys. Hebrew? Hebrew. You would think, well, I mean, they, they speak Hebrew. They're going to write in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. The Book of Mormon. At least a Semitic language, though. Right? Yeah. Well, Something well, from that era, book, area. Well, I'm interested to see what you think, what the, because the Book of Mormon literally says within its text and Joseph Smith copied down characters of the gold plates to be confirmed by uh, archaeologists, Egyptologists and stuff like that. And the Book of Mormon was written in Reformed Egyptian, not in Hebrew. It was in the Hebrew language, but in Reformed Egyptian. That is really odd. Why would someone who was trying to create a, a fraud choose to do that? And in actual fact, people tried to criticize, you know, well, why, like, they wouldn't have written in a form, reformed Egyptian. That's just, that's just silly. What, what, like, they would write it, write it in Hebrew. About sixty years after the Book of Mormon was published, um, I'll, I'll show you something. Share screen. Um, have a look at this. So they found this, and so uh, this is called the Papyrus. M. Amherst 63, a document written in Egyptian demonic and dating to the second century BC 13. It's cool. And what it is like, wow. it's been preserved. It was preserved in an earthen jar. Um, and what it is, it's the Hebrew language written in Egyptian. Wow. Um, the letters were clear. Uh, and, uh, and, and actually, when they actually translated, it even has a version of the Psalms written on it. It even has biblical verse in it. But it, the language is Aramaic, yet it is written in Egyptian. And where did and they so, find this? So uh, 60 years so. after? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this was after the Book of Mormon was published. Okay. But where Confirming. it was, it was also fi found here or what that was found? No, in no, that was found Egypt. in the Middle East. Yeah. Okay. And. Uh, Confirming that this was actually a practice that was done, okay. that the Hebrew people would write their language in Egyptian because the Egypt, Egypt has like three different alphabets. And uh, and it seems like some were just more convenient to write because, by the way, the Hebrew alphabet is a little weird. They don't write vowels. Um, and so 
uh, like uh, they take out the vowels and that, that can mess with um, pronunciation at times and things. And so that then is like, where if you, there's one kind of feather in like the Book of Mormon, why, why, like Joe Smith had no idea about, you know, them, you know, the Hebrews writing Egyptian. He just said, this is what it is. Okay. Yeah. Um, and take a look at the characters. So let me um, find, uh, da, 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 it's, uh, I have an image that shows the characters of, that were copied down on the Book of Mormon. It's not appearing. Do I not have it there? Hang on. I'll, I'll look it up. Um, Question, do is this, yep. are the golden tablets, have, have they been lost to time? The, like, are they somewhere? I was going to, that's a good question. Yeah. So there is, a, a, like, there's an apocryphal account um, of what happened here. And uh, and because it's apocryphal, I, I, I don't know if this is exactly, exactly what happened. Joseph Smith, after the translation, literally could have just hidden them somewhere. So nothing, they couldn't be tampered with and they can be come out at a later time. Uh, the apocryphal account is that, because it doesn't come from Joseph Smith, it comes from saying, so, it comes from someone else who said, Joseph Smith told me this. And it's that he returned the golden plates to a, uh, a cavity in the rock that contained all these other records, which looked to be other records from the Nephites. And he put them back there. And, and by the way, one of what was also present with these was the Sword of Laban and some other interesting artifacts. And uh, and then the mountain closed up. And that's where it remains uh, to this wow. day. It sounded like from description that this cave was actually the cave that Mormon dwelt in when he was writing the Book of Mormon, abridging the record from all the other um uh, bridging the Book of Mormon from all the other, and this is pre-Mormon persecution. This is still in up east, like New York, right? Yeah. So, well, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, uh, this is before they kind of settled in Nauvoo and then um, Missouri and yeah, got kicked yeah. around and, and all of that. Okay. Um, and so uh, here is I got an image here that shows some really interesting stuff about the the script because Joseph Smith copied down, um the characters that were on the Book of Mormon. Now, bear in mind, this is a guy that has no formal education. He should not know what these characters are, okay? And so he copied these down. This is These are the characters um, that he copied down. And to get confirmed by an Egypto Egyptologist. An Egyptologist, yeah, looked at them and confirmed. These are authentic um, Egyptian characters. And he even said, oh, there's some, I think, what's it like? like there were some other characters from other, some other reference. But um, yeah, it's like, that's there. So... There is a Native American tribe. I think they're in Canada. They're called the Nick Micmac tribe. Micmac tribe. Um, take a look at their characters here. So you can look the, you can look up the Micmac tribe. Right? <laughs> so this is some of the characters in their language, and this is some of the ancient Egyptian characters. Wow. Okay. Hmm. So then have a look at that. Have I'm, I'm at... noticing some similarities. I just wanted to point yeah, that yeah. out. Just, just, so, yeah, <laughs> you might notice just in case. <laughs> well, Pyramid well. is God. Yep. Hmm. Have a look hmm. at um, the hmm. Micmac hieroglyphs compared to the Nephite hieroglyphs on the Book of Mormon. Oh, That's these ones. Wow. Eerily similar. Eerily similar. All yeah. Right. Wow. And so crazy, crazy stuff. Not okay, only is so them... possible, just a question. Could it be that he was using their writing to create this? And so, there's like a, there's a weird connection with that native tribe to Egypt in some way. There is no account of Joseph Smith having contact or uh, communicating or knowing uh, this uh, this mm -hmm. Native American tribe, and it also doesn't explain why the Micmac characters match certain Egyptian characters. Okay, there's not an expl explanation for that. Mm -hmm. And so there are connections, though, because the um, the, the of course is that these are actually descendants of or, or maybe not even descendants but they inherited some of the uh learning and language that the nephites used uh that then they now have because those characters are so They're shockingly very close. similar yeah shockingly similar to the characters that um joseph smith um copied down uh and like that's just that's just one crazy thing uh, we're not talking about evidence in the actual text of the book of mormon because like, again, if Joseph Smith was making this up, it, like the Book of Mormon is not structured like a text that someone would 
make it up. In actual fact, it is structured by uh, like it has multiple authors giving accounts. And there is a section in the Book of Mormon where one of the prophets ends up quoting large chunks of the book of Isaiah. Now, if Joseph Smith was running to create a new book of scripture, why would he write in scripture that we already had? But there are these large chunks and quotes. We're talking chapters, okay? Uh, up to like, like I have the number here. Uh, there's tw 22 lengthy Isaiah quotations, nearly full chapters, as well as 27 additional references and paragraphs. What's happening here is the prophets love the book of Isaiah and the prophecies, and they taught it to their people and quoted it a lot. Uh, they loved the book of Isaiah. Now, this is the weird thing. The, the Isaiah that's written in the Book of Mormon does not match any because it's not, <clears throat> of course, it, it, it's clear, it's Isaiah, it's very close, but there are differences in the text, like a word wrong here or something wrong there. A right? Translation Tran difference. Well, yeah. <clears throat> it does not match word for word any translation of Isaiah in any version of the Bible. Hmm. If Joseph Smith was wanting to try and um, make this look really, really authentic, and why why was he not copying Isaiah word for word from the most accurate source? And he always says the King James Version was one of the most accurate. The most accurate, he said, is actually, I think it was a German translation of the Bible. Um, but it's not word for word. The thing is, though, the Bible, um, Isaiah, like the King James Version, is very likely not word for word either because of translation errors over many generations. And so... How could you then claim is one of these versions more accurate to original Isaiah or not? How could do we have a reference, an older translation of Isaiah that we can see? Is this actually a more accurate version of Isaiah in the Book of Mormon than the current translations of the Bible? There wasn't at the time that Joseph Smith was alive, but have you guys heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Uh huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. So they were discovered well, well after the Book of Mormon was published okay right. the dead sea scrolls has the entire book of isaiah in it and they were written around 600 bc around this time of lehi okay they, they, they are they, there's a very um uh, close kind of time period of when they're written the isaiah in the dead sea scrolls does not match any modern biblical translation of isaiah okay but the, the isaiah in the dead sea scrolls is closer in translation to the Book of Mormon Isaiah than it is to any biblical translation of Isaiah. Hmm. And so it's just another I'll kind have of to like, take your word for that. But yeah, you can look. <laughs> well, the, I, I have a reference. I have, a, I have a, um, a link I can share about a study that was done on this. Um, because we Mormons, we like to study a lot of these these things. And uh, so this one comes from a BYU professor, I think. Um, and so again, I could just another, another thing. And, and there's a list of stuff, um, uh, that we can go through, which is just, you know, I thought some of the symbolism up. and stuff matching up was kind of weird. That's kind of weird. We mm -hmm. see, yeah. We how see do you that. explain that? Well, how do you explain any of the similarities between things around the world? Yeah. Uh, it just yeah. happened independently and accidentally guys. Somehow. Didn't coincidence. You know of course. Yeah. It's coincidence. Well, Here's an interesting thing, because people have tried to analyze the Book of Mormon, trying to figure out, all right, what's going on here? Because the Book of Mormon, uh, according to the text, right, has around 21 authors. There's Nephi, Jacob, Jerem, Omni, and it goes through different prophets, different descendants. Blah, 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 and that blah, all blah, blah. came from the plates, right? All came from the plates. Okay. All right. That's what the Book of Mormon claims. But if someone made it up, it's going to have a primary author that made it all up. Joseph Smith either made it up or Oliver Cowdery, and they just wrote the entire thing. Have you guys ever heard of a thing called word printing or stylometry? Uh, mm -hmm. So it's a really fascinating thing where you can take someone's uh, uh, written work, right, and analyze style, how often they use certain descriptive phrases, their sentence structure okay. and everything. And by putting it through stylometry, you can identify an author by doing it. And they did this with Jane Austen. Jane Austen has an unfinished book. And so there was a, a writer who came in, studied Jane Austen writing and finished the book, attempting to their very best ability to copy Jane Austen's style. Stylometry, when you put that book through this system of analyzing, it can pick up the exact point where the new author comes in and starts wow. writing. Mm. Okay. So it can actually be shockingly accurate. Well, they put the Book of Mormon through this 
to try and figure out if it had uh, a primary author. They compared it to Joseph Smith's writings when he was writing in a scriptural kind of sense of speaking as a prophet. They compared it to Oliver Cowdery. And then they compared it to the internal authors who was writing it because the Book of Mormon is structured in this weird way. Remember how I said I had 21 authors? Well, then a lot of their words were uh, condensed and paraphrased by Mormon. Remember, Mormon condensed all these records. Mm -hmm. And so there are times right. when Mormon is actually speaking from himself. And I'm Mormon. I'm putting this in here because of this reason. It's really good. Now we can get back to the record as is. Uh, and then we can compare when he wrote that compared to the parts where he was paraphrasing from his own words, compared to when he's giving direct quotes from other authors. And so not only did the word printing stylometry come back that Joseph Smith did not write it, it came back with multiple authors having written it. And this was oh. the, um, uh, this was the, this is the, how it looks like. So it specifically came back with uh, four primary authors in the Book of Mormon, which is this kind of group here. And Joseph Smith is way off here. Wow. And, and so all of Mormon's writings were be out, you, was able to be identified. These ones are likely Mormon. These ones are when Nephi is speaking. And this is Moroni and this is Alma. And those are the um, prophets that get most of their words in, in the Book of Mormon itself, where there was enough of a sample size that they could determine this. Now, you notice how Mormon, uh, Moroni, Nephi, and Alma are pretty close to one another. That's because their style of speaking, their cadence, was somewhat similar. Um, but even with their similarities, like, and it came to pass and thus saith and all that, right? Um, they were still distinct that they came up as separate authors in the Book of Mormon. Do you see how separate Joseph Smith is <laughs> to, to um, yeah. their style? Like Joseph Smith like, was completely separate mm. to the style and writings of the authors as presented in the Book of Mormon. And bear in mind, if he like if he faked this and just made it all up, he achieved something that professional practiced authors that were intentionally trying to copy someone else's style could not do or achieve. And 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 this is the same with all the other supposed people that might have had input in writing the Book of Mormon, Oliver Cowdery, and uh, and the, all the people that had uh, you know a hand in the um in the translation. And so this is. This is crazy stuff. So even according to this um, analysis, the Book of Mormon actually holds its own weight. And then, holy crap, then there is stuff that the Book of Mormon knows that Joe Smith, not either Joe Smith could not have known at the time or was not archaeologically discovered, but has references. We're talking about Hebrew names that were not even known to be Hebrew names that appear in the Book of Mormon, like Sariah. Sariah is uh, Lehi's wife. All right. Um, not known to be a common Hebrew name in Joseph Smith's time or even known. And the, it doesn't appear in the Bible. And only after the Book of Mormon was published, do we find the name Sariah in Hebrew texts that were found after, after the fact. Um, the name Alma it was an interesting contention because Alma is a name that actually appears in in Latin as a female name. And people said, see, Joseph Smith didn't know that Alma was a, was a, a female name and he just grabbed it from somewhere else. And then later we find the the, the actual uh, kind of breakdown of the uh, syllables in Alma and everything to have masculine characteristics in other uses in Hebrew later on. Um, Mo, like Mosiah in ancient is an ancient Hebrew word that uh, Joseph Smith could have not have known the ancient Hebrew term Moshia, Moshia, Mo, Mosiah, sorry, Mosiah, and. Moshia signifies a champion of justice against oppression appointed by God, whose mission is to liberate chosen people from oppression, um, especially by nonviolent means. Um, and so Mosiah, right? Yep. The term does not occur in, in, in the English King James Version of the Bible, um, but it is a major theme of the book of Mosiah in, in there. And uh, then there are like archaeological. So when Lehi and his family are leaving Jerusalem, uh, you can actually look up, if you want to look up Nahom, the Nahom idols, you can look this up. There's a Wikipedia on them. N-A-H-O-M. Um, so when Lehi and his family are leaving Jerusalem, uh, they actually take another family with them. Um, uh, and, oh my gosh, the name just, uh, Zerum. I think it is, um, my, the name just literally just slipped my mind. I can't believe, it. but anyway, the father of this family dies and uh, 
his he is buried. Now, what's interesting, the Book of Mormon account, whenever they uh, st uh, stay by a river, Lehi names the river after his sons. Like he, he calls the name of the river Laman or something like that. Um, and by the way, that's actually was a, a Hebrew practice, an ancient Hebrew practice of naming the location they stay after kind of, you know, relatives and things. Very unlikely Joseph Smith had any idea that that was a thing. But then when uh, this man dies, it, say, it simply says, and they buried him at Nahum. Um, I could look up the specific thing, right? Um, and and it's not Lehi naming anything. Uh, was it 60 years ago? I forget exactly when. There's an archaeological dig. And in that dig, they find a town. And in that town, they find a, a temple. And in that temple, they find four altars. And on each side of the altar is the Hebrew word Nahum. And it corresponds exactly to where Lehi would have been up in that point of his journey as they were traveling through the wilderness to get to uh, uh, the seashore to build the boat and and sail and leave. And uh, that's, a, that's a big archaeological um, point right then that the Book of Mormon actually specifically names that was later found in an archaeological dig after the fact, after the Book of Mormon was published. And that's just, that's just another one. <laughs> and, and, uh, do we want to look, do we want to bring up uh, the Nahum altars? I'm not sure if you guys are looking at it yeah. at the moment. Yeah, yeah. I was trying to look for yeah, them. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't find a, you said altars. Yeah. Uh, I just found Nahum. Nahum altars. Just... Yeah, here they are. Um, so if I take this screen out and share this screen, I'm not sure if you guys have it, but uh, I'll bring it up. You can put it up. Where, where was this dig? It says in the Wikipedia article. Um, but if you have a look here, so it's these are the not Nahum around altars. here. <laughs> yeah. And so these are the altars here. Do you see them? Yemen. And, and Yemen. Yeah, so here's the map. And so this is the path that um, Lehi and his family followed from Jerusalem to the seashore. And Nahom is smack bang right there along the path that they would have traveled. Um, and another interesting thing that uh, Joseph Smith wouldn't know. So when they get to the seashore, Lehi and his family, they stay at a place that they call Bountiful. And it's actually quite lush and green. And what's odd about it, for where the location where they are, it's not a green place. It's a desert. So how did uh, Joe Smith be able to know that there is this lush green place with trees and, and uh, some resources there to build a boat on this um, this side of the thing? Like, uh, it's a smaller area. It doesn't appear on maps. But when uh, we've gone and looked we have found there's two really high locations for Bountiful. One that seems very likely, and it, it hits the description of what Bountiful looked like exactly, and it's in the exact correct place of where Lehi would have been at his journey, where they sailed from. And again, it's one of those things that there's no way Joseph Smith would have had any idea of where Bountiful was when he was writing a Book of Mormon. And so there are, like I said, some really crazy, crazy stuff that the Book of Mormon not only predicts, but nails completely. Uh, and that's just another one. It's wild. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I got more. <laughs> Do you yeah. Want to keep yeah. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> yeah. Don't stop. I'm, my brain hurts. I'm trying to like, <laughs> decipher all this. All right. Guys, there is a term called chiasmus. Chiasmus is a really intriguing thing. So what it is, it's a figure of speech in which the grammar of one phrase is inverted in the following phrase so that the two key concepts of the original phrase reappear. And it's kind of a type of repetition, but does not make. So a, a perfect example of chiasmus is she has all my love. My love belongs to her. That's a chiasmic phrasing and sentence. OK, okay. now. What is interesting about this is this uh, rhetorical structure uh, method after Joseph Smith, this is well after the Book of Mormon. Uh, and so in the mid-19th century, 
there have been uh, several putrid scholars, mostly mom, non-Mormon theologians, right? They've published on the subject of chiasmus. And their work shows that the chiasms, they appear in Greek, Latin, but the literary form was originally Hebrew. This literary style of, of, of dictation, of rhetoric, is originally Hebrew. By the way, non-Mormon scholars wrote about this after Joseph Smith, um, you know, he was well dead at this point, uh, and dates to at least the 8th and 10th centuries BC. <laughs> and so then they, they go to uh, Psalms and Isaiah, and actually find okay, there's chiasma in the in the Bible. There, there, and it's and it's a very sophisticated structure of rhetoric where um you will see the the lead up phrases where uh, phrase phrase preposition phrase key, key point and then bang 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 reverse order point 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 mm -hmm. okay um no one in America let alone uh, in Western New York fully understood what even chiasmus was in 1920 uh, in 1829. Joe Smith had been den, dead a full 10 years before John Forbes' book was published on this subject. Even the prominent scholars today know very little about chiasmic forms beyond its name and a few passages where it might be found. So the possibility of Joseph Smith knowing about this is basically zero. Now, the Book of Mormon, it is uh, claims to be a Hebrew, well, um, written by people of Hebrew descent. Chiasmus appears everywhere in the Book of Mormon from the prophets when they're teaching. All right. And so I'll share my screen because it shows direct examples of what a chiasmus is. And then it shows here are all the chiasmus structures in the Book of Mormon. And this is a very sophisticated ancient Hebrew style of rhetoric that people didn't even know of um, when the Book of Mormon was published. And so uh, I will stop sharing it and... Uh, um, uh, I'm losing myself. I'll find here. I lose myself all the time. Oh, it happens <clears throat> a lot, Gary. I, I, to me, especially. Um, all right, I can share my screen now. I think yes, share. All right, so this is uh, one of the studies that were done. It and so first, it shows you examples of chiasmus in the Bible. All right, um, some simple ones like here's one in Psalms Save me, oh my God, for thou hast smitten all my enemies. Say it to you. And then do you see how it goes in reverse order? And they line up to basically describing similar things in reverse order. So that's a chiasmic structure right there in Psalms. And then Isaiah, and they can get really complex. Like if you are writing rhetoric, right, to write a chiasma like in this in this thing takes a lot of forethought and structures like all right this is the this is going to be the structure in reverse mm -hmm. order all right and so then we go down and these are heaps of examples in the book of mormon of chiasmic structure we've got one here in second nephi mosiah and they get pretty complex uh they get to like really huge and significant so these are all chiasmic structures in the book of mormon and look at how complex they are getting that they still follow the chiasmic structure but they it gets like there's yeah. actually more sophisticated like look at this one this one is from the book That's of mosiah huge, yeah. this one <laughs> wow. is a huge one it goes all the way it's there just a parallel of the phrasing yes, yeah that would take exactly. so much like forethought to like <laughs> exactly we're gonna right? go this and then what are the opposites yep. of those or yeah yep yep wow and and so it wasn't put wait, in there it, by wait, is this was was this supposed to be written by the guy who wasn't very good at writing that's the claim if jo like if if the book of mormon is right. not an authentic ancient record joseph smith must have done this intentionally mm -hmm. and no one even knew what chiasmus was when he wrote it right right and it's it's all in there it's like the book of mormon is actually filled with this so that's insane it's just like Holy crap. You know? Yeah. And uh, that. Hmm. Oh, oh, uh, this is a fun one. Like, um, there's a part in the Book of Mormon where um, the Book of some of the Book of Mormon, like the Nephite economic system is described. It's in Alma chapter 11, verses 3 and 19. Um, Alma, like, he's having an issue with these uh, that you could call them lawyers, essentially. And uh, and is saying a problem is is that they get paid when they handle or conduct a case, and so these lawyers are actually being encouraging discord 
so they get they can work on these cases and they get paid and then he ends up describing some of the money system and the money system that he describes has crazy parallels to um a recorded babylonian money system um the primary conversion in ancient babylonian was between a barley and a silver uh, he describes the exact same conversion thing. Uh, nine other provisions uh, convert values, additional commodities into silver values, followed by three more provisions that were uh, converted into measures of barley. Thus, precious metal and grain measures were converted in each. And so in the Babylonian basic economic value system, basically th there are crazy parallels between those two. Um, and I, I have a reference here that we can go into that. Here is a... Here is a, yeah. here is a one. Uh, by the way, yeah, I, I can just keep going, but I don't want to, like, if you guys have questions or thoughts or stuff, because it just keeps, there's more. No, I, I know so little about Mormon, any, like, this kind yeah. of an education on it, so. Yeah, basically, same here, yeah. I'm a Lutheran, same. Uh, and I am <laughs> been know what I am. since I was. Agnostic. Yeah, well, I mean, I was, I was confirmed a Lutheran. I'm a, I don't even know what I am now. I believe we came I'm from Mars and. I believe in Atlanta. So that that's whatever, really, whatever that is. But um, yeah, like uh, that's what I know of religion. Right. That, mm. That's pretty much it. Uh, so. Um, all right. So, well, here's another, the oath of allegiance, right? So there's a part in the Book of Mormon where some, a group of soldiers make an oath to a prophet um, about um, uh, that they will fight. They will hold true to their values and everything. Um, it was a covenant which they made and, and in it, they cast, so how they do it, they cast their garments before the feet of Moroni saying, we covenant with our God that we shall be destroyed. Even as our brethren in the land northward, if we shall fall into transgression, yea, he may cast us at the feet of our enemies, even as we have cast our garments at thy feet to be trodden underfoot. If we shall fall into transgression. So this is a very interesting and specific way of making an oath. There is an oath of allegiance um, that is, uh, so what is it? It's, a, it's an ancient Hebrew oath of allegiance. Okay. And this is what they say. Just as, so they place the wax um, and the mutton fat in their hands and they throw them on the flames. And so this is how the Hebrew one is done. And they say, just as this wax melts, and just as the mutton fat dissolves, whoever breaks these oaths, showing disrespect to the king of the land, let him melt like the wax, let him dissolve like the mutton fat. So declare, so be it. Now, as in the Book of Mormon, the ob they, so the Book of Mormon oath and this ancient Hebrew one, an object is likened to the participants in the ritual. And so in the Book of Mormon, the object that's being likened is uh, their garments. And in the Hebrew one, it's this mutton fat that they throw. And so that is one for one, the exact type of sim same symbology that's happening here. Um, and then, and so, yeah, and then they, then they say, should the soldiers break their oath, they would suffer the same fate as the object. That's the symbolism. So if we break our oath, we will suffer the same fate as what happens to this garment. And the Hebrew one says, we'll suffer the same fate of what happens to the, um, the, this uh, wax, right? And then he, the priest presents to them, before their eyes and he throws it on the ground. So he throws what they say. And then they say like they trample it underfoot and they speak as follows. Whosoever breaks these oaths, even so let um, the hath people come and trample that man's town underfoot. And so if they break the oath, you'll be trampled underfoot as we are trampling underfoot this thing. Remember what the book of Mormon oath says. He says, um, if we shall fall into transgression, yea, he may cast us at the feet of our enemies, even as we have cast our garments at our feet to be trodden underfoot, if we shall fall into transgression. It's the exact same symbolic structure. Yeah. Um, show, big, sorry, that image from yeah. the video where they talked about like Yom Kippur and like the similar Native American uh, like holidays or feasts. And oh, yes, yes they were yes. To, to Hebrew. Yeah, and this one is I'll follow that up because I have the transcript of Graham Hancock's talk about the similarity between ancient Egyptian religions and indigenous people. Indigenous well, people. This is one of the well, crazy things. The newer I... indigenous people, because the indigenous people to America before that were all killed. Yeah. In, yep. Um oh. so 
one of the things that archaeology doesn't seem to like to do is to listen to the traditions of Native American tribes. Right. They say, <laughs> these are our beliefs. This is our religion. This is what we believe happened in the past. Archaeology ignores it completely. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, across the board. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. across. They'll believe it to a certain point, like the king's list. There's two king's lists, by the way. There's there's the the, the Mesopotamian or Sumerian. I can't remember the one. Uh, uh, king's list. And then there's ancient e Egyptians king's list, which is pretty accurate till it gets to a certain point. And they go, no, it's all fiction after this because the shit gets crazy before that. Then you have reigns of a thousand years, 10,000 years, 20,000 years. Uh, but so, you know, they, they do that all the time uh, down in South America. Viracocha. Ah, he's full of shit. You're full of shit with <laughs> Viracocha stuff. Yeah. Really? Because we like all kind of believe it. You know, it's like uh, it goes back and back for, for days. It's like believe all indigenous people until they start sounding fucking crazy. Like <laughs> yeah. that, you know, like uh, not even at that just point, crazy. Disregard them. Yes. Not <laughs> even crazy. So even just when they break from the well, narrative, what attitude. they say, yeah. and you not know, this is them. this is what happens. As soon as they break from that narrative, now uh, just disregard what they say. And so well, this uh, is I don't think there's any doubt at all that the new religion of science wants to distance itself from religion any way possible, including removing things that might con confirm the historical accounts. I'm not even talking about the spiritual accounts, the historical mm -hmm. accounts and places from biblical text, uh, Quran, you name the text. They, they want to disassociate with all of it because science is the new religion and no religion can have a competitor and blah, blah, blah. You know, all that stuff. So mm -hmm. I, without a doubt, we, we talked about giants a lot. And, you know, that uh, I something I used to think was just cockamamie gobbledygook. But, man, there's so many stories from around the world. It's not just America from around the world. And yep. when uh, the settlers came here, when the conquerors came in and <laughs> came in and conquered this country, uh, they there was millions and millions and millions of mounds and they fucking wiped them all out. Yeah. Yeah. They and wiped them all out. You know, there was one mound structure. Uh, that actually looked like it has the like a depiction of a menorah in its mound structure and a uh, yeah yeah Jewish, I saw that Jewish wow. lamp and um like old symbols of the compass and the square that were actually made in mounds and it's been completely wiped out now uh, and it's one of and it was during this surveying mm -hmm. thing and it was the only one that was wiped out amongst the surveying group amongst all these other mounds. But this one that it looks like it's depicting a menorah and and an oil lamp, that one was wiped out. It's like, so let's take a like a practical again, <laughs> just trying to be as objective as possible with what little knowledge I have. But let's check, just take a practical approach. Say a group of people from the Middle East got in a fucking boat, got lucky, and made it to America. I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility. I just yeah. no, yeah. I flat out don't think because because. There were, there was the sea people. We don't even know who the fuck they were. There was the sea people and they were, they just, they were known as that because they would just come in and conquer the shit out of uh, other places. Uh, uh, I think it was around the Medi Mediterranean. So yeah, I think they could, uh, and we have the DNA evidence as well. So I certainly think there were people here long before the Vikings, uh, Columbus. No, you know, I, I, I think there was a, a lot of influence. Yeah, so, I completely so. agree. And I, I, I'm also interested to like try, because this is not a study that I've dived into heaps, but to see certain parallels, uh, like, um, so the Graham Hancock documentary that what was it called again? The uh, uh, Ancient um, Apocalypse. Yeah, Ancient Apocalypse. Really fascinating. And, you know, where he's referencing all these accounts of this great flood from mo multiple different civilizations and everything. And it's just, it is fascinating because some of it really seems like, okay, that might correspond to this thing over mm -hmm. here in either the Bible or Book of Mormon accounts. And, and yeah. uh, there are some just fascinating stuff. Um, but like, so we were talking about, you know, um, uh, Native American customs and stuff like this. Like, look at this. So this is a Cherokee corn ceremony compared to the fall feast ceremony of Israel. And you might not notice to be confused with geeks and gamers corn the long way. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> You you might notice some interesting parallels between the two. 
-hmm. Yeah. So in the first one is Cherokee green corn ceremony. It is a feast of harvesting in the late summer or fall, the fall feast of Israel. It is the feast of harvest harvesting in the late summer or fall. The ceremony begins by all members going to a running body of water and washing ritual immersion in running water is customary prior to Yom Kippur. Uh, the ceremony begins with fasting and a session of forgiveness. Yom Kippur is a day of fasting and a time of forgiveness. Wow. Um, can, yeah. I so they forgive, match up. I can forgive time. people and still eat. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> true. <laughs> it's a lot easier for me to forgive people on a full stomach. I'm just saying, but yeah, you know, they're trying to test each other. I get it. I, I get it. I get it. Uh, fa now fasting is good. It's very good for you. Uh, and, and keep in mind a lot of stuff that like a lot of biblical rules come from, like, for example, there's a lot of, there's, there's some rules in certain religions that you don't eat pork, that you don't eat pork. You want to know why? Because back then they didn't know the, the temperature you had to cook it at or it'd kill you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's uh, a lot of, a lot of stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff like that. So I find um, it really interesting. Like these are very, very similar, but a lot of these practices, maybe in individual cases are also seen in many, many, many other cultures, you know, celebrating at the uh, winter solstice and this, and the, uh, summer solstice like that that kind of harvest season um washing yourself in the waters of forgiveness kind of thing like there's a lot of these that maybe not all of them so aligned like this one is but you see them individually in tons of places i find that really interesting about the human like what is that that connects us in that way we have the same ideas about rituals about religion we come to those same conclusions. Is there a mother civilization like we've talked about that kind of connects us? Is there a source? Is there a source of some kind? Is it that we just have the same brain and it's made up in the same way that it falls into the same, you know, ruts and it thinks of the the spiritualism in the same ways? That's a, Off it's fascinating. It is. Uh, offerings are made to the thunder beings. I like that. Yeah, I like the thing. thunder beings. I want to be known as a thunder being, but you could also, yeah, too much Mexican food. What's but, stopping uh, you? The thunder uh, thunder offerings. Thunder. Well, I think we've all been thunder beings like once in a while. <laughs> At some point. Uh, <laughs> uh, offerings and sacrifices are made to the gods within a sacred circle and deep pit. They take wood from a tree struck by lightning mm -hmm. to light the fire from four cardinal points. The altar of license, which stands in the tabernacle and represents the four cardinal points of, of the earth, is lit by fire. You ever seen a tree be get struck by lightning? Any of you? Yes, I haven't. No. I have too. I have yes, that is it is you have? wild. Yes, yes, That's a couple cool. of times. So uh, I was at Folsom, and uh, Folsom's right next to Folsom Lake, and across the lake. There was a lone tree and we're just kind of kicking back, smoking our rolled cigarettes. And this sucker, like lightning just, boom, it just blinks. And the thing glowed. It wow. like, like for a good solid second, it like just went and then caught on fire. It was, a, it, it looked like the crystalline entity for a second, you know? Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Like it's it was, dope. It was yeah. dope. Then we, that then, happened uh, to us. It was across, it, we had, our house was right next to a park and a tree on the other side of the park. Plasma got boom smashed and it was the same kind of thing it like it glowed right in the middle it was like the hottest yeah and then and it then just burned from the inside yep it's so weird so weird but cool uh within a, uh, i read that one uh matrons take coals from a sacred fire in the circle to uh a new year's uh home fires fire from the altar of sacrifice is taken and given to all the tribes of israel to light their standards i just want to point out Battlestar Galactica, real quick. Mm, so say we all. <laughs> so say we all. So Battlestar Galactica likes to use a lot of religious iconography, and yeah, you know, they do. And and remember that Earth was the was the lost colony. Remember that. Uh, you know the original create the original creator of Battlestar Galactica was Mormon. Uh, really? Glenn A. Larson. What? And he, uh, Glenn yeah, he A. Larson. Yes. And he actually put in Mormon religious references in the. Yeah, well, the there's Egyptian, show. there's Greek, and yes, he did. And uh, honestly, 
I'll say to this day, uh, the first Battlestar Galactica had one of the best science fiction concepts ever, ever. They mostly used it in the remake of BSG, but they kind of went away from the alien stuff, they, which I yeah. like. Yeah, like, uh, I would. Yeah, I would love to see in another reality where um they don't make crap from Hollywood. I would love to see like another take on Glenn A. Larson's version of Battlestar, which was awesome, by the way. Freaking loved it. Um, what's the mother planet in Battlestar? Cobol? Yeah. Isn't it Cobol? Uh, um, yeah, no, Cobol. No, uh, no, the mother? Capri oh, it's Caprica. Cap uh, Caprica. Well, Caprica okay, is well, the what's, city. What's the Cobol? city of Caprica, right? Isn't there a planet somewhere in the Battlestar Galactica lore called Cobol? I thought it was like... Yeah, um, yes. Or, no, the Lords of Cobol. Or wait, I don't know. I just I just rewatched the first like half since I saw it. Because so. yeah, in 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 Mormon theology, Caprica. the planet the planet or one of the thirteen is... colonies. Yes, thank you, mm. thank you. Well, chat. The chat will will correct. Chat's there we go. There Google. we go. Chat, chat is better than Google. The chat knows. <laughs> they know. Right? That knows all. Um, <laughs> so in Mormon theology, the planet or star that is closest to heaven is Kolob, and so. That's the collab. Oh, All right. So Kolob. he just swapped it. Around. I watched yeah. the best. I wish I could. I'll find it in my history and I'll share it with you guys. I watched the best fucking video last night. So it was where all science fiction worlds are in relation to our world and our galaxy. And like all like, and he's talking about science. It goes from hitchhiker uh, to yeah. Dune to everything. And uh, it's pretty rad. Dude, like, send that to me. Huh. I will, yeah, it's like a 45 minute video. And if you're just a straight up nerd, you can see where Krypton is and as opposed cool. to Earth. That's cool. Everything. That is awesome. Ah. That is rad. It is such a great video. Ah, ah, chat says Cobol was the original home, they're saying. The, okay, um, the OG yeah. home was Cobol. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because, uh, they, yeah, because they go there. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. I need to rewatch it. It's been a minute. OG so, Cylons. Yes, the OG Cylons were reptilian. That they they that's the one thing they left out. So the the Cylons weren't like just AI. The OG Cylons were reptilian. Remember remember the remember Lucifer? I have a Lucifer action figure. There's a there's there's a character. There's a robot guy named like Lucifer. Like from the first from the original, original Battlestar. Battle yeah. Really? Never saw the original. Yeah. But they yeah there was there's like these reptilian aliens. Baltar would talk to them and stuff. Cool. There you go. So uh, all tents are arranged around uh, uh, the four cardinal points of the sacrifice fire. All Israel camps at uh, Sukkot. I hope I'm saying that right. Around the four cardinal points of the tabernacle. Now, <clears throat> we can go back to that. Let's share this real quick. I'll give you the uh, the thing and the thing. Here you go. That sounds very, very awful. <laughs> well, while we're bringing that up, this I find really interesting because I understand there are certain types of convergent evolution with uh, certain rituals. Like uh, you see multiple rituals, yeah, at the summer solstice or the same kind of time and everything. Mm -hmm. But to get this level of parallel between right. yeah, the, right. the practices, that's, that's, that's not convergent evolution. Yeah, that is, it, it, no, that that's there's that's crazy. That's crazy, but there, you know, there is the lost tribe. Yeah. So many similarities. So many similarities. A lot of Mormons out there, man. Uh, I, I so, um, you know, Jim. I don't think Jim McMahon was a Mormon. Steve Young, the quarterbacks, right? I watched them both play at Brigham Young because they'd always come in and beat the shit out of San Diego State, and uh, I watched <laughs> them all the time. Uh, I also had relatives in Idaho. Lots of Mormons in Idaho. Lots and lots. <laughs> So there'd be like kids when I was a kid who could not drink soda pop. Could not. Well, drink we're allowed soda. to drink soda. Not back. Not in the eighties. Not with some. I thought so, you couldn't yeah, drink not soda. With, earlier. Uh, uh, not nineteen eighty. There, like. there are some members who take um the word of wisdom pretty uh, pretty like far, but it's not the core doctrine. And so the word of wisdom is uh, alcohol, tea, coffee, harmful drugs, and smoking specifically. Then that's up. Oh, there was uh, a reason we fell, I fell out with those relatives. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Coca Cola and soda has been a thing that a lot of members in the past says, "Oh, you shouldn't drink that," but it's right. never been a core doctrine. And so yeah, okay, well, it's, you're, you're a bit way looser on it now, but like back that's then, that's what I thought. Was, I thought Mormons the, the were like, no. I was soda. told I was told by my yeah. mom like, don't offer it to them. Don't even, <laughs> don't drink it in front of them. I'm all screw that that's their choice <laughs> that's their thing man. yeah yeah whatever <laughs> um all right so 
This is the timestamp summary of what uh, Graham Hancock says about the similarities between ancient Egypt and Native American religions. There are similarities between ancient Egyptian and Native American religions, suggesting a shared legacy with both cultures believing in an afterlife accessed through the constellation of Orion and the existence of menacing figures that can hinder the soul's journey. Indigenous cultures in the Americas used uh, wildcat skins and what the hell is that word? I, you, ayahuasca. I, oh, ayahuasca. Ayahuasca. Drugs. Ayahuasca. Drugs. Ayahuasca. Yeah. ayahuasca. Wow. There you go. Uh, <laughs> you should have known. It's Graham Hancock. <laughs> yeah. represent, I know. Big, big shock. Uh, to represent the stars and the access altered states of consciousness, which Evidence suggests a lost civilization migrated to the Amazon and influenced ancient Egyptian culture, challenging traditional theories of human migration. Uh, evidence suggests that someone was traveling and mapping the world during the Ice Age, as surviving maps from the 1400s to 1700s reveal extended Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia, a joined Japan, and the existence of an underwater island off the east coast of North America, while the Amazon rainforest contains plants that create a powerful visionary brew called ayahuasca. By the way, for it to work, you need uh, it's a it's a it's a brew that you have to have with like some sort of a root, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's two like just completely different like plants, basically. I think leaves and a and a root or a bark, something like and that. And prepared in a specific way. Prepared in a specific way that it's not just something you figure out overnight there's a lot of trial and error i'm sure there's a lot of guys well, who just you died got tripping. your root in my yeah. <laughs> plant well, it doesn't even work What's... right so because one has to like the end the the stomach acids break break down mm -hmm. the ayahuasca so it just doesn't work so you need something to counteract that right which means the guy figuring out how to counteract that the guys the Scientists. thousands <laughs> tens of thousands of of lackeys you know it's like beaker you know, in the month. Yeah, try this. And Beaker had to go try out. This. And, yeah. <laughs> try this. Yeah. <laughs> There's some poor guy to some medicine man, like the medicine man Beaker. Yeah. Uh, so uh, do, 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 I was there. Uh, visionary brew called ayahuasca. Graham loves his ayahuasca. Uh, Shad, he really does. Uh, the Amazon <laughs> was home to a highly skilled civilization with advanced agriculture, large populations, accurate astronomy and a possible connections to ancient Egypt and Mississippi Valley cultures. The ancient civilizations of the world, including the Amazonian Stonehenge, Angkor Wat, Serpent Mound, and Stonehenge, all had intricate alignments and structures that celebrate the connection between Earth and sky during solstice, solstices and equinox showcasing the advanced engineering skills of these civilizations ancient native americans and cahokia cahokia and other sites of america have advanced astronomical knowledge and sophisticated civilizations challenge the belief that civilizations originated solely in mesopotamia with new evidence supporting the presence of humans in the americas thousands of years earlier than previously thought now keep this in mind the serpent mound uh any mound m like i can't say all but the 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 stuff that looked like basically pyramids right they had the plateau it looked very south american all of that stuff was uh was basically facing either uh the equ equinox the solstice it was aligned to some sort of stars you can't just do that by going <sighs> Yeah. Okay, right here. <laughs> right there. Start digging at night. You know, right. it, it, like, it requires it math and engineering. Mm. Math and engineering. So, so you got math, engineering, and sciences happening all in yeah. ancient uh, hunter America. gatherers. So, so, hunter so gatherers. Yeah. Your guy in the video, to his credit, was like, you know, um, in some of these books, they're going to be called savages. That's that's it's fucked up because they weren't. It's obvious they weren't. Uh, and, uh, a lot of the, especially the older cultures, um, were pretty prosperous, pretty peace loving, kind of got along in the beginning. Uh, it was later on where a lot of, I mean, they still had conflicts and stuff, but there was like later on, that's when the, the conflict started 
through scarcity mm-hmm. and our our boy luke caverns uh discussed this and so did so of others because disease there was yeah. disease here prior to columbus so uh and and maybe that came from other people you know we we don't know and we'll never know we'll never know but um they were pretty fucking smart and uh and and i think that's that you know we have science fighting and, and that's where like you could find common ground with the mormons like we're a lot of people are saying there were people here a lot earlier yeah. than what people said and this doctrine of nope nope uh remember uh, graham loves to bring it up the clovis first doctrine which are a uh, people who are around during the younger Dryas who just completely disappeared we see their tools uh we see their arrowheads they're very distinct um wg out there my boy said uh, we had a conversation because I asked, I mean, have we ever found a Clovis bone? Have we ever found a Clovis body? And the answer is no, but they think they know where some are, but they can't dig there what? because uh, it would be up to the uh, who, whoever, you know, the indigenous people of that tribe to dig that up and you'd have to get their permission. They're generally not down with it. Um, and can, you can't blame them. Like you were like, Hey, what about science? It's like, you know, you fuckers have, broken so many promises to us <laughs> yeah like go fuck yourself but um, no more promises like no. i get it no, i get it there, there's even like um so uh there's this uh, guy who's like a seventh like he's a generation of one of the cherokee people and he's mentioned that this is rumor there's it's not substantiated but there are claims that um there are native american kind of uh, tribal groups and everything that have artifacts and records that they are keeping away from anyone's touching on because of the tendency that when some of their heritage gets discovered, it gets destroyed and it gets to, exactly. or taken. Exactly. Yep. This is mine and, now. Yep. And so that there, there's actually some, I, and look, this is his claim. I know. And he is a, is a descendant of native Americans. And he says that, yeah, there's actually some really significant stuff that, uh, the, you know, giant the, skeletons. <laughs> <laughs> it's like i get, I get and- that but preserving mm-hmm. preserving the facts of your culture i feel like you would want more people to know about them um, but this is the thing like academia has such a um a track record of if it doesn't align mm. with their narrative they throw well, it in the east river they throw it in the east river yeah smithsonian <laughs> they throw yeah. it in the east river or that yeah they 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 they, uh, they they force it into their narrative and they're doing that with people's culture Right. right. Uh, they're doing it with our culture right now. So what do you think if they're going to do it to their, you're like, oh, they're woke. It would be absolutely for the indigenous people. No, the indigenous people are just something to be used. Yeah. Like that part of academia, like has not fucking changed. Not, not a hundred years, not 200 years. Um, and these institutions in no way are to be trusted at all with anything anymore. And, and well, and you remember when that was considered dangerous rhetoric, and now you could just say it. people go, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like we get it. A good example of right this direction. bias, yeah. A good example of this bias in academia is the Bat Creek Stone. The Bat Creek Stone, because uh, the uh, way that it was found uh, actually seems pretty legit. Doesn't seem like um, it could have been faked and put in there. And it was accepted as an authentic. Oh, is this you know, the thing they turned upside down? Yes. yes yeah, the let's thing see that. Let's see that. Um, do you have a picture so of it? Because I do. We can bring up a video that goes through some of the okay. history of it. Um, and so that's the first video I sent you, Gary. Uh, so not the second one. The first one is more detailed. It's only 10 minutes, but we can pause and kind of break it down a bit um, on the Back Creek Stone. Do I don't want... have that video. That's in the research tab. Research, okay. Let me find it. So this, uh, re, uh, FF research tab? Yeah. Of our super secret Discord? Super <laughs> secret. Uh, Hebrew Native yeah, Americans? Sh- that one? Don't say. No, no, no. Oh, um, I just the, blew the, the one before that. Our super secret Discord. I just dropped. I just dropped the link in the chat. Bat right Creek, there. got it. Yep, Bat Creek. Bat Creek. Where's Bat Creek? Where is it? Yeah, Isn't, is uh, Bat- Central America. It's like what somewhere near. I forget. Missouri, I keep forgetting. You're like enough. Yeah. You're like in. I'm not an American. Yeah, I'm- it's in Tennessee. <laughs> Tennessee. So uh, okay. Tipton Mound Three during an excavation of Hopewell Mounds in Loudoun County, Tennessee. Good old Tennessee. Some of those mounds. 
Back in Texas, so, by the way. Thank this Texas. guy was doing uh, an excavation thing, and he actually worked for the Smithsonian. I, like, we can watch some of the video, just confirm some of these facts, because they mention his name, who he is, right? Um, and uh, one of the interesting things, right, is because I actually think that some artifacts, there's a, probably a good chance that they were faked, but mm -hmm. some do not look like they were. There were some people who actually were going out wanting to prove a narrative. And so there was like this one guy that actually, he was outspoken saying that there were Hebrew people in the American continent. And then he found, you know, some artifacts that seemed to confirm that, which does cast doubt. Like people saying he was just, yeah. you know, putting in well, this guy. Right? We have to deal with that in UFO and everything we do. Is there so mm -hmm. much bullshit that, and, and the side of it, can absolutely destroy the real stuff and, exactly. and some of it like yeah. in ufo in particular some of it's put out by the government just to, it's like that shit in mexico just, dude those yeah. alien bodies oh <laughs> that was ridiculous so, yeah do we want to watch some of this video because oh uh, yeah do you have any have all... specific i can just hit play hit play it's a short enough video i think but... to his leg that would distress him for the rest of his life but his civil war service is not why this ceremony is taking place we can skip forward yeah that's a dope pistol. Sorry, just saying. Bird was a meticulous record keeper and had a talent for sketching his name. the various archives. The meticulous record keeper cultures that lived in this part of the country as far back as 3,500 years. Emmert was a meticulous Emmert. record keeper and had a talent for sketching the various archaeological digs which he often supervised. In 1889, he was working on a site which contained three mounds. One large mound located on the east side of Bat Creek near Loudoun, Tennessee, and two other small mounds, which were on the west bank of the same creek where Bat Creek intersected the Little Tennessee River. Mound one, the large. So, an official Smithsonian. He, he was working for the Smithsonian, and he was known as a meticulous records keeper, trusted. And he finds these three mounds. So the first mound is of little in, uh, interest. We can skip that because it's the one that has the buried people in it. Yeah. So, the, so if we skip forward to where it shows the buried people, all right. So it has these buried people in it, and then what he um, uh, accounts is that underneath the skull of one of these buried people, he finds the Bat Creek stone. So this was buried deep. And very unlikely that someone, you know, discovered it before him and placed it in there. That's, mm -hmm. that's no, like this was the first time this was uncovered. And this is the stone that he found. Now, he believed this stone was an example, I think it was of Cherokee language. We might, I forget exactly, but they uh, believed it was actually an example of Native American script. Okay. All academia accepted it as that. It was displayed in the Smithsonian for years. All right. So if we pause it, though, it was only like six. And by the way, sorry, this guy who discovered it, that's what he believed. Okay. He, he thought it was that. He was never saying, oh, look, here is uh, uh, something, uh, you know, evidence of something else. And we'll find out what that is. Because what happened was someone was doing it. Like, I think it was like 60 years later. Someone was studying it. Right. And they turned it upside down. <laughs> and then they're like oh well already oh. it looks like the characters that you were showing yeah. us earlier yeah. yeah uh this is ancient hebrew and it says for the jews that's that that, that is literally what it says right and, and the considering the time i can absolutely see what the fucking smithsonian <laughs> would go uh, nope nope uh, <laughs> as soon as that happened as soon as that happened it was instantly discredited. Before, it was perfectly authentic. The the way that it was found, everything. After, to be fair, nothing... they could just mean that piece. Right <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just this, uh, just, just this, just this, just this. So, so but, before that, it was totally accepted totally as a real legit. artifact. They didn't mm -hmm. try yeah. to just debunk it. But then when they said mm -hmm. that, yeah. it's all fake. And, it's all. It's a. It's a. It's a hoax. Fake. And. And what's interesting is like then they they've tried to say federal that, government. That there's been a lot of cope with it and jumping through hoops, stretches of logic to try and claim that it's a fake, even though the account of how it was found does not marry into this. Okay, it, like the way the, the guy that found it never said it was Hebrew. He thought it was, and so 
like he actually thought it was legit. He thought it was a Na uh, Native American script, right? And so it certainly wasn't him trying to fake it. And he was the first guy that found it. It was undisturbed before then. This It's very clear that this dates before Columbus, right? And it, since that time, right, there's even been some separate people who have looked at this. And they have looked at how, see, see how it's carved into the stone. They've looked at how the edges of that carving has actually kind of weathered and worn down. And there is a separate scratch on this stone that dates to a similar time to when this individual found it in the I, I, there's a, okay. it's early scratch. And they can compare the weathering between that scratch and its original state. And it's it's completely different weathering. The weathering on the actual carving of, of these words really seem to indicate this is old. This is wow. pre yeah. predating. I need to I need to see those that finding. Well, yeah, he actually, if you skip forward, um, there's a guy, there, there's a guy that actually says uh, him. So skip forward to when he first appears. Yeah, yeah. He says he's had a look at it, and this is what his opinion is on it. It wasn't dated, so there's no real way of determining when the stone was carved, or is there? My microscope. This is Scott Walter. See him another time. He is a forensic so geologist. He's an expert of determining the weathering and thus the age of carvings in stone. And the bottom line is, is that the weathering of the inscription is very old. And the only way that that could happen is because it's documented that it was found in 1889. The only thing that has changed on that stone since it was discovered is that sometime between the picture that was taken in 1891 there's two scratches on the stone. They're not there. But in 1970, the stone is published in Argosy magazine. They did an article about Cyrus Gordon's work, and those scratches are there. And it turns out during my examination, those scratches were freshly made. They created a geologic profile that was totally inconsistent with the original inscription. And in fact, it was the key piece of evidence that gave me the confidence to say, there's no reason to question the veracity of this discovery. John Emmert did not do anything that he has been accused of doing. And this is a genuine, legitimate artifact that, was, that has been in that mound as least, is at least as old as when those people were placed in the mound because it was under the skull of that deceased person. And there were those two brass bracelets. The bracelets were, that were found with the artifact were also tested for metal content. And interestingly enough, they contained copper, zinc, tin, and lead. Rarely do you see lead, but the lead was put in there to give the metal more malleability. But the ratio of the two bracelets together with samples that were tested of first and second century Jewish bronze work in the Mediterranean were so statistically close, it's unbelievable. The Bat Creek Stone. Huh. Yeah. Cool. So the metalwork, the, the, the inclusions in the metalwork match Mediterranean metalwork. This is another great That's example of, of civilization or people getting to the Americas far before we thought they did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility for a Jewish merchant or traveler of some kind or whatever yeah, they had a to lot of get boats, there. didn't they? Yeah. Right. Yeah. They, they a lot. They ran uh, the seas. A lot of merchants. So yeah, it makes total sense that they would they might have gotten here and then said, "Hey, uh, this is for the Jews. <laughs> like we've <laughs> we're conquering this land, right? Yeah, or uh, whatever." Yeah, they were humans it never for. do that. Human yeah, right, yeah. Summer goes never do there. anything like go on <laughs> to the right. do that the at all. lunar never body happened. and put down a flag or anything like that. Um, so this stone, I think, was put back on display, but then they turned it back upside down so the Hebrew wasn't noticed <laughs> on it. Okay. And, 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 in the video that you said that they yeah, that funny. they um the gave it back it? to the to Cherokee the people. Or, Cherokee uh, people. Cheyenne, Cheyenne or Cheyenne? Cheyenne? I think it was Cheyenne. And uh, they sued the Smithsonian to get the bones back of their people and this artifact. Guess what? Bones missing. Right bones there. are gone. Can't find them. East River. East River. Yeah, East discarded. River. Horrible. Um, if you don't know the story, uh, John Reeves is the Boneyard Alaska guy. Uh, Shad, you should like his his stories are unbelievable in a really? very in a two acre spot. He's a gold miner, big, mm -hmm. rich gold miner. He's on Joe Rogan a couple times in a two acre part. And by how, how he gold mines the same way they do 
uh, that they uh, basically the guys go up to uh, Siberia and the Permis Frost and steal mammoth bones. They just get hot water and they start spraying the ground and melting the permafrost. Uh, it's really dangerous work, but not on the gold, if you do it in Siberia, but in the gold mine, they're fine. And they just do yeah, it. On I was going to say they could just get they could just un uh, deep no, the you, uh, bubonic plague. Well, yeah, it's up there, dude, dude. There's a there's a documentary of a guy going uh, following stupid. following the 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 black market uh, ivory traders and who go to Siberia because like even Russians don't want them doing this, and they go out there and they get the uh, the ivory for China, China. Uh, because I, I aphrodisiac, all kinds of crazy shit. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's yeah. mosquitoes. You could fall into mud pits. Like, watch the documentary. It's crazy. But um, for the John Reeves guy, he was uh, just in this little two, uh, two acre part. He's found hundreds of thousands of mammoth bones, short faced bears, dire wolves. Dire wolves weren't even supposed to be up there. So he's found all this ice, mm-hmm. all these ice age bones that look like they were hit in a flood. And they all died in the same place in the mud, mm-hmm. and the, their bones are bro- shattered and broken. They found one tusk, or it was a horn, where they found a blue feather, and they don't know what the fuck the blue feather is from. But obviously, from a bird, but it was impacted into the horn. There's, a, they found crazy shit. Now, what he, what he completely admitted to, and didn't want to admit to, because he can't, because mm-hmm. it changes the whole thing, is all the human bones that he's found. <laughs> Because he can't say anything <laughs> about that, because that'll bring the government there. Uh, but his story is the land, he, the the people who own the land before him or his, I don't know if it was his family or the, just the period, um, gave the Smithsonian a bunch of those bones to study. But it was just a study; they were supposed to give him back. They never get him back. He's su- he's got the time. He sues the government, um, and he finds out that most of the bones are gone, and he finds out that most of them were dumped in the East River. So he on Joe Rogan's show says, I'm going to tell you where they are. I'm going to start a bone rush right now. On the, I, I'm not, I'm going to, I'm just saying an example. I don't remember the name of the street, but I think he said 27th street right at the end of 27th street. That's where they freaking dumped him into the East river and sure as shit. People went there and they found bones. <laughs> wow. they fucking found bones. <laughs> so if you don't think the yeah. Smithsonian is up to some fucking cockamamie yeah. bullshit, you're crazy. Yeah. And federal so government, when, they're part of the federal government. Yeah. When that, so when they got sued to give the Back Creek Stone right back, right? They mm-hmm. forced the um, uh, I forget which Native American group uh, who did it, right? But they forced them to sign this thing that if they ever display the Back Creek Stone, they have to continue to display it upside down so the Hebrew. <laughs> yes, yeah, <laughs> and I'm sure I'm sure that like wow. the, the chair the Cheyenne's like. Okay, we'll absolutely do that once we get to our sovereign uh, reservation. Go right. fuck yourself. The hell? <laughs> Screw off. Um, so what people are not too familiar with is that there's actually a lot of uh, claims of uh, tablets and artifacts that have uh, Hebrew inscription. One in particular is a big one, and it's in that video. Maybe that one's worth showing because now – I don't, I'm not sure all of these are valid, but there are so many. Uh, like when Missouri was being cultivated and they were digging up their, their fields, the, the, the reason why it's worth showing is that the sheer insane number of these artifacts. It's yeah, they showed crazy. a picture of each county. It was Illinois. Miz- I can't remember what state it was. Yeah. It showed that they found at least one in every single county. Every yeah. single county, they found an artifact. Um, and, uh, if you want to find the picture of all the artifacts, we got to get soups right after this, but, um, yeah, some of them do look fake. Like, absolutely. They look too new and too fake and like, not like, uh, uh, native American art at all. And then there's stuff, stuff there's a couple things that look like mm-hmm. it could be. Yeah. And, uh, that's like, a, oh my God, chat. What's his name? The father, the, the Catholic priest who was in South America, who uh, everybody brought the, the the bronze yes. plates to. God, what was his freaking name? Uh, a lot of the stuff uh, they brought the the uh, he was like a monk or something like that. I can't remember, but he was there for the Catholic Church originally. Uh, but he was so nice to uh, to the, like the people loved him that they brought him gifts. Now, initially, some of those gifts were probably real, and then people started making fake ones to give to him just because they loved him so much. So he had this huge collection. He didn't deny anything, you know, 
And uh, of course, all the all the all, whatever real stuff is there has got completely obfuscated mm-hmm. by all the fakes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Even though there it's are like Catalina uh, Island, dude. Ancient. This is where ancient aliens does good. Okay. So they, mm-hmm. because they have access and they have a bunch of damn money, they were able to go to some of the the uh, banks that took all of this and have it hidden away. So if it's so fake, why did the government banks take all this stuff and hide it away? Well, they got access to stuff and it turns out some of it was real. Not all of it. And but. I'll be, th- you know, think about it. the easiest way to discredit some of these things is to make fakes and then seed them in. And yeah. there is actually an example of a guy, right? Who he, he didn't believe all any of it. He thought it was all fakes. And to try and prove how gullible people were, he made a fake, buried in a thing, got people to discover it and it got taken seriously for a time it was written in hebrew but his it was his initials on the thing right but it goes to show you that like this was actually something he did he made a fake right yeah. to discredit everything yep which could include actual you know real authentic pieces because yeah. some of these things and so that's that's an admitted one where a guy who was a skeptic of it all admittedly purposely made a fake to discredit everything and so the fact that people might make fakes to try and discredit the authentic ones is a known admitted practice well, it may not so, even be just to discredit but there it's kind of a gold rush that that happened with um uh paleontologists right? with, with with dinosaurs Dinosaur when you just dis- yeah. when you start discovering it then you want you go oh they're getting grants to do xyz i could do that if i come up with a dinosaur bone so you can have the same situation here somebody actually legitimately find something that's amazing some artifact and then a bunch of other people go oh so did i look what i found and those are then then muddies the water yeah. you don't know which one's which yeah yeah you know what's crazy about dinosaur a bunch of different bones? Reasons. there's parts in america where uh, you know they're still like exposed they're still finding stuff that yeah i was just walking you know it's like they didn't have to dig anything yeah. they just like oh i saw on the side of a wash there's this, you know, full dinosaur. <laughs> it's like, what the hell? That's crazy. I'd love to see so that. On the far left here, you see the... Oh, wait, put oh, that ooh. image back up. My bad, my bad. <laughs> it's okay, I'm just kidding. On the far left, you see what was the... Uh, so see that picture? It's just a picture. It looks like a hair pick. Uh, it looks like a hair pick. This. looks like they're combing the desert. But that's actually Before the, from... they added the fist. I, I can't remember, like, uh, what, what the term is. It's not topography. The menorah. I'm sorry. Yeah, but it's but it was the uh, the map that they did in the 18 has the surveying they did of all the oh, mounds when they found bottom them. left. Mm. The bot- you yeah. see that in the bottom left. Yeah. That's the surveying okay. drawing mm. of the mound structure. And if you see it bigger, uh, it looks a little better when you, if it's yeah, blown yeah. up more. Yeah. Uh, but the... The menorah has a very specific number of candle points to it. Okay. That's what makes this intriguing because that's how you identify it as a menorah is that specific number. Mm -hmm. And that's what we see right here. I'm like, hmm, you know, it it, it does make you uh, consider. And then on the, on the far right, you actually see a carving of the menorah um, uh, located in one place. And one of the interesting things is the ascription, because he mentions the name of what, a number of native american tribes called god and so if we go skip forward to where it shows a reddish looking rock just to hear him what he says on that um because this is the name of uh, um the god and uh, it appears in a lot of supposed finds on many artifacts from the eastern u.s and canada you'll see this symbol this is a word in the cuneiform language which originated in the middle east shortly after the time of the Tower of Babel. Yet, it is a sacred symbol in many Algonquin tribes right here in North America that has been passed on through the generations from their ancient ancestors. Why is it sacred to these tribes? Because it is the name of the Creator, which is read from right to left, and the name is yod heh Va. Now, like I said, this Sounds symbol familiar? has been found Yod Jehovah, Heva, Jehovah. Yeah. Hmm, you know, all I said was that fish was good enough for Jehovah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, Sorry, but he life. then goes on to show, Bad like, life for Brian. Life for Brian. like, just 
a crazy amount of artifacts that have that symbol that appear and as to how many are accurate and how many are not he proposes that because there's a couple of guys that are accused of being flat frauds that made like you know fake artifacts right but then there are a heap of artifacts that have been found that predate they're like these guys even being alive. Um, and so it doesn't seem like they, like if they, you know, they didn't make these and there is a map that he shows of how many of these artifacts are cut. And so I'm not sure it's too far forward from the point here, but he shows like in Missouri or somewhere Oh, it was there. Um, how often these things were being dug up, right? They're scattered all over the, like, holy yeah, wow. crap. Like, 27 counties verified mounds with Michigan artifacts. And if, like, was there just, like, a, a group of fraudulent people traveling all over Michigan, burying these things everywhere for people to find? Like, and then he talks crazy. about the, the, the copper mines in Michigan, which are the other piece of Michigan that's practically just up on Canada that's across from the lake. The, the uh, yeah, so that, that that's, you know, a lot of the copper came from there. Uh, and, and these are thousands, these mines are thousands of years old. Now, now those that's scientifically proven by the way, mm -hmm. but we have to get to soups wow. mm -hmm. uh, while we still have Adam here and, uh, yeah, fascinating fading. stuff. Shad. Nice. When's the what sun going to come? What time is it? What time is it's, it for you, Shad? I, it, not a problem here. It's uh 1230. Uh, and so just been like after mid midday, midday. midday for me. And this is, yeah, good. this is good. Mm -hmm. 722 <laughs> cool. here. And, I should be asleep right now. It's, 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 mon it's Monday for for him. Yeah, he's in the future. In the future. Yeah. Well, I'm a, I'm in. It's Monday for me too. So. You're also you know, in the future. There's one Not last thing. One. Could I share one last thing? Because this is one of my sure. favorite things, and I didn't really get to it because I have a spe something special to show you guys with it. Right? Ooh. Is okay. that um? So in the Book of Mormon, in the early part, is it a Mormon jobs, sword? It's a Mormon sword. I'm not kidding. Oh, I was so, I was actually uh, kind of joking. <laughs> no, it is. I, 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 okay, okay. You mentioned so, it earlier. Yeah. So Nephi right. finds a the sword of Laban. It's, now, a, he, it's a sword with multiple sheaths. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, here is the thing. <laughs> <laughs> that caught me off guard. That was great. Yeah. That was a good one. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> the sword of Laban has been used to try and attack the Book of Mormon for a long time because when Nephi picks it up, he says specifically that it was made out of the most precious steel and he identifies it as steel. And this is 600 BC and people are trying to say they didn't know how to make steel back then. The Book of Mormon's full of crap. Well, after the Book of Mormon was published, this was like yep. in 1980 or something like that. Yeah. In the Jericho Valley of Jordan, they find a sword called the Verid Jericho Sword. And guess what it's made out of, guys? Steel, it's baby. Steel. It's it made out steel. of steel. That's and wild. It, it dates to 600 BC. The exact of same, it does. Time, same time. The exact same time Nephi found it. So I did a study on what the Sword of Laban would look like, referencing the Verid Jericho Sword. And this sword is big. It's one meter bit long. Like it's a big sword. Wow. And, okay. And then, and then one of my viewers made it. And look what I got here. This oh, is, wow. that's awesome. This is the Sword oh, of Laban. Clean. That is very cool. I like and so the Sword of Laban is said to have a gold hilt. This is, of course, you know, brass to make it look. But a uh, solid gold hilt made in the style of the time, got the correct length, and based off of the very Jericho sword. This is probably the most what, Whatever kind and generous person who made that uh, totally leave off the gold. Shh. Yeah. <laughs> Could have at least plated it. <laughs> yeah. So this is the most accurate replica, as far as we know, of the sword of Laban in the world. Right that's now. awesome. So, nice. it's really that's awesome. Dope. And that, that's and, mentioned in Technology of the Gods, folks. Uh, oh, actually, the very Jericho sword? Yeah, the steel goes, mm -hmm. actually steel production goes a little bit before that too. A lot yeah, before that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, uh, found, I, they found a lot of, uh, uh, see like iron, they can explain away, right? When they find iron before iron because they're, well, they must've got it from meteorites. Right. But 
I mean, steel. <laughs> how many yeah. meteorites are just lying around? That's, you know, that's but technology. Steel is a man. whole different thing. So, and not only that, the very Jericho saw they confirmed that it was deliberately hardened into steel. And and then the crazy thing about it is that it was made intentionally. The handle on the very Jericho sword isn't steel; it's iron. The steel is on the blade, but the handle and the ridge of the blade was iron, which meant they actually knew the difference between the steel and the iron, and they put hardened the steel, steel for the edge. Yeah. On, the hard, on the hard edge so that's, that's cool. how sophisticated they had they knew about steel work at 600 bc again joseph smith this literally that like the common knowledge still didn't exist back then there's yeah. no way he could have known that no. this was uh, this was only archaeologically confirmed like 80 nearly 100 years after the book of mormon was published uh and that so that's an awesome oh. archaeological reference right there and yeah that is the and the sort uh, of way that that stuff the sword of Laban was handed down amongst the Nephites through their entire generation and was buried with the gold plates. Joseph Smith found the sword of Laban when he dug it up. And some of the witnesses saw the sword of Laban. They picked it up and they handled it. And the sword of Laban was returned with the gold plates in that same mound where the gold plates mm -hmm. were rested. But there are accounts of people seeing the sword of Laban and it became almost like it. So it's when you say it's a Mormon sword, yeah, it's kind of like a, it has. So. It has significance. There is an apocryphal account about the sword of Laban that when he returned it, an angel took up the sword of Laban and unsheathed it. And he said, this sword will never be sheathed again until after the battle of Gog and Magog, uh, which is the second coming stuff. Um, and but Kingdom it's come. Yeah, awesome yeah, DC the final, the final thing. The um, but that's the... Now, that was not directly from Joseph Smith. That was someone giving account from Joseph Smith. But so as a result, the Sword of Laban does have a bit of significance um, with the second coming now. That uh, and, uh, and so in our church. And so that's the replica right there. Awesome. Interesting. Mm -hmm. That's cool. We, we have a donation from Zorbu. $50. <laughs> Thank you, Zorbu. Who was our coolest abduction? Well... There was one guy named Joe who we grabbed in 1987 who took us surfing. That was epic. <laughs> Weirdest abduction, quarter earthling. Wow. He kept leaving us fresh cut roses after probing. Just creepy. <laughs> All in your head, bro. Hashtag restraining order. Uh, Robert McDonald for $20. <laughs> Gary, what happened to the coast to uh, final frontier coast? You've gone Aussie on us. Ugh, this show has gone to the flightless birds. Uh, oh, what's this? Oh, machicolations. 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 Remember when we were at the Tower of London and there was that really aggressive bird? Oh, yeah. they were so cute. <laughs> I don't know if it was aggressive. Friends. It was chill. He's just hungry. Was, yeah, I mean, he didn't, like, he was hungry. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't say aggressive, but they said don't get near them because they'll fucking True. bite your fingers off. Yeah. And they were, they were like they huge were big. They were not they afraid at all. They were just they like chilling that. next to you. Like, mm -hmm. you going to give me something to eat or what? Yep. <laughs> uh, as going, th or, uh, sorry, Shad going, th I do that so much. You wow. both have accents. I get them mixed up. Um, <laughs> when we were going through the Tower of London with Shad and he was the best tour guide there, that was fucking awesome. That was awesome. That was, awesome. That was really cool. Uh, uh, Neil Horn. For twenty dollars, says, uh, "Hail everyone! You guys are doing great, and I love Shad. We love Shad too. Keep it up. Carry on. Before I forget, does the Book of Mormon talk about emus and the danger they pose to mankind? <laughs> That's apocryphal. They left it out. Mm, yeah, uh, because obviously God favors the it's, emus. It's probably in the sealed <laughs> portion. So, in case you guys didn't know, there was actually a sealed portion of the gold plates that Joseph Smith wasn't allowed to translate. But the prophecy is that that sealed portion will be translated." At a later and it time. said the emu shall inherit the earth so it might have something in there we don't know yeah. yet we'll see uh the ginger menace for 20 dollars gary uh you know i grew up in utah my dad was a polygamist before he died in december 2019 wow uh he had been uh th that way my whole life branch off from the mormons and uh and that's where most of the polygamists are that are still in america they branched off from the mormons they're they're still around by the way in like there's yeah. like 10 of them but uh so, and that's why my mom divorced him uh she didn't want us to grow up in a cult good because it was wrong uh and and downright confusing to be honest with you it just <laughs> it sounds like uh i'm just on 
on tax returns. I mean, I guess you probably get, do you get an extra marital tax for an extra wife? Might have I have no that. idea. Like but, um, yeah. Taxes. Joint. Oh I, God. Just and I can't remember my own anniversary, let alone multiple <laughs> anniversaries. <laughs> I didn't get expensive on mother's day. Sheesh. I have this one thing to say on that. Now, the, the church, we the polygamy, we believe is a sin unless specifically God commands otherwise under very specific circumstances. But overall, I, it's, we don't don't agree with it. I do find it interesting, though, that with such a liberal, broad view of relationships and marriage, and you can marry who you want and everything mm. nowadays, that. You know, in that modern liberal sense, there are people who have such a problem with polygamy. Right. Where yeah. It's like the polyamory, the polyamory people have, yeah. A, yeah. have a problem with polygamy. It's like, how? Wait, what? Well, polyamory tends to unfold with one chick and several dudes. So it's like the inverse oh, of that. Oh, they don't want the other way around. Ah, okay. Uh, it's mis it's misogynistic. Totally makes yeah. no sense at all. Uh, <laughs> chain 315 for $50. There are short stone farm walls everywhere here in New England, so many that they estimate the colonists would have had to build two miles a day back in the 16 to 1700s. Native tribes didn't farm here like that. Makes you wonder who started it. Well, Tartaria. Uh, tar Tartaria. The Galactica, I don't know, but um, I know that a lot of that stuff. There's dolmens in the Northeast. Uh, um, I'm blanking on his name now. He's it's an Italian name. The, Jim Vieira. Jim Vieira uh, talked about that's how what got him into the whole Giants thing was uh, finding all of the megalith megalithic type uh, stonework in. Uh, New England, which everybody just said was the colonists, but but why? I mean, there's a lot of it that doesn't make sense. There's also that, I mean, we don't know what it's from, but there's a very strange wall in the Bay Area that extends across the whole damn Bay Area. Uh, Weird. People from the Bay Area know what I'm talking about. Uh, and you can look it up. It, it goes all the way down practically to, to you know, uh, uh, parallel to San Jose. Um, don't know. They don't know who built it. It's fucking long, though. It, it, uh, there's drone footage now of how long it is. A uh, lot of that stuff. A lot of that stuff. Uh, they also, in um, California, I lived there my entire life and didn't know this. There is, um, it's not like as big as the Nazca lines, but there is um, petroglyphs like dr drawn in the ground out near, is it Blythe? It's out in the desert. It's out in the desert. And there's a little ring fence around it that you can drive to been there for who knows how long uh people have been here for a long time and the fact that it can stay well for one it's in the desert nothing can survive out there so i can understand why that survived but oh, wow. uh yeah there's a lot of weird shit next time we go out to cali i'll, I'll we'll go to that i'll show you look at that yeah that's dope. so weird <laughs> it's near uh uh lake havasu city yeah Blythe. a couple of them yeah Wow. No fucking idea those were there. They just don't talk about them. But you know what? When I was in school, Shad, hmm? and when I was in school, I mean, okay, it was in a cave, and uh, it wasn't with any kind of language. We were just communicating through grunts. But uh, no, uh, when I was in school, <laughs> they never taught us about mounds. Never mm -hmm. fucking heard about them. Mm -hmm. Never heard about them. I heard about them later from a teacher in high school in my, in my last year, who was like, oh, it's not part of my curriculum, but we're going to talk about mounds. I mean, it's crazy. There, the, the sophistication of some of these Native American civilizations get completely overlooked. Like the mound yeah. builders, specifically in Central America, right? They are building some really impressive stuff. They knew how to smelt. Uh, I and then and then, but everyone when they think of like Native Americans, especially Central Americans, they think of the plains roaming Indians, and it's just. That was that. Old. That was long after the like they were kind of decimated. So yeah, yeah, um, exactly. The, like yeah. the yeah, the, the Mayans uh, Native had, Americans had people... libraries and books. They yeah. they spent a, a shit ton yeah. on books. Like Luke was telling yeah. us about that. That blew me away. I didn't know the Mayan civilization was that advanced. You know, they were. It's insane. Mathematically crazy. Oh in, yeah. intellect. 
Raven K for $20 says I was in the army with a Mormon dude. One of the nicest dudes you could absolutely trust with your life. He got back from Afghanistan, a different person. Mm. A, a lot of people mm. dead. A yeah. lot, a lot of veteran suicides right now. And uh, 22 a day. Uh, uh, it's beyond, beyond tragic. And our government could give a fuck. Fuck them. So sad. Josh Kelsey for $20 drops 20 and just leaves. Just leaves because that's what he does because he's mm -hmm. Chad Kelsey. Uh, Samuel, the infamous for $20. Have you mentioned the Geriadites? Did I say that right? Geriadites? Yeah, Geriadites. The Geriadites. So I mentioned them tangentially. They're the group that uh, migrated to the American continent from the Tower of Babel in the account. And uh, mm. it's in the Book of Ether. The account is actually wild. It covers thousands of years. And... Uh, People often misunderstand, I think, the reading of Ether because they think the Jaredites wipe themselves out. No, a specific kingdom of the Jaredites wipe themselves out in the millions, in the in the counting of the millions. But there was a point where there was a schism amongst the Jaredites and then a famine when it really indicates that they they spread across he, all of the American continent hmm. uh, from a very, very early time. Um, but yeah, the Jaredites, the account there, like, yeah, it's it's a wild one. Samuel, but they would they oh sorry I'm just no, they're no. not Hebrews though the Jaredites, um and so uh, like I said the account goes starts they're all with named the Jared. Babel. <laughs> uh, Samuel the infamous for twenty dollars says I am not a Mormon but I do find it interesting how seeing stones and gold plates gets ridiculed by people who believe a brutal uh, uh, a brutally murdered man got uh, back up three days later and didn't take revenge. <laughs> I mean, like parting of the Red Sea. Yeah, the, the miracle is all in the Bible. And it's a long say, game. Yeah. It's a long. <laughs> it, it's it's more about justice. It's more about justice. Let's just be real. But that. they they suddenly want to assume that God ceases to being a God of miracles outside of the Bible. And I was like, I actually think God cares about all His children on Earth. And and by the way, the Book of Mormon. This is one account of one of the branches of the house of Israel. We believe that there are other scriptural accounts of Christ visiting other sheep he has, which are not of this fold, outside of the Nephites. Yeah. Well, like mm. we think he well, actually visited know about the a lot of yeah. people and that their scriptures will come forward uh to you know at a later date. Um and so, but but then they say, ah, yeah, translation and miracles, suddenly that's off the table. When it's like, hang on, isn't that the standard of how God, you know, communicates with his children on earth? Doesn't he work miracles to bring forth his word and call prophets? And I think we're, we're Mormons are the only Christian faith that claims we have a prophet leading our church. I think there might be some actual branches but um, from us, but we're one of the few Christian faiths that actually, when I say like we're the only Christian faith that follows the Bible completely, when I say follows, like, Polygamy is a good example. Do, do other Christian faiths actually have a doctrine that explains how polygamy is used by God in certain instances? Because Abraham, he was he had more than one wife. Moses, what about baptisms to the dead? Paul mentions that explicitly um, about baptisms to the dead. And there, there are doctrinal points like, what about the two orders of the priesthood? The Melchizedek, the Aaronic priesthood. It's pretty explicit in Hebrews explaining the two orders of the priesthood. And so, if you want to like, if you want to actually define what. Christ's church should be doctrinally, according to the Bible, and I'll stand by this if anyone wants to talk about it, the only faith that follows nearly, when I say like all the doctrine as set forth in the Bible, is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I'll go through each doctrinal point, um, and I've tested this. I'm not a member of this church by accident, okay? I'm a member because I genuinely believe this is the restored church of jesus christ on earth the church he established when he was on earth and it's the same pattern that he has followed throughout god god has followed throughout the history of mankind calling a prophet and teaching his people his word and when there is an apostasy and we see apostasy all through the bible it happened with moses it happened with abraham okay it happened with noah when there's an apostasy what does he do surely the lord god will do nothing but he revealed his secret unto the servants his prophets that's a word for word quote from the bible he calls a prophet, reestablish his word. Joseph Smith was the prophet who he called to reestablish his word after the apostasy and falling away of Jesus Christ church and his apostles when he was on earth. And a Adam needs to fall away right now. He's about to fall asleep. <laughs> no, that was, uh, that, it, I mean, I, I learned a lot about Mormonism mm -hmm. uh, and like basically what, because I, I was actually really clueless as to what it was. And like, and then you just really just. Mm -hmm. 
drove it home right there too at the, at the mm -hmm. end so that was that was really awesome uh shed it's great having you on i uh guys my pleasure genuinely i, I really I appreciate it. let me come and sure. just you know speaking about something that i love so much and that um do you, like if you think i'm nerdy with swords no that that is double yeah. when it comes to this stuff i'm like, <laughs> like well i do yeah. think you're nerdy with with swords so mm. yeah i, uh, I, I understand well. that but uh yeah it was great and uh thank you for coming on and i'll, I'll see y'all next time i'm gonna go to bed because it's late for me Bye. Mm. gotcha adam. time to go to bed cheers hey adam. Bye. We're supposed Bye. to uh, take care, Adam. Go oh, see okay. base, base staff Monday. Base staff Monday. Tomorrow. Uh, Geek Grind Coffee. Geek Grind Coffee. We well, we Scroll have a, a special. Scroll up to what? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hang on. Okay. Fresh code. We got a fresh We got fresh code. Learn to code, everybody. Uh, from Geek Grind, uh, I created a new discount code, NERD24. NERD24. It is active now and provides 24% off all Nerdrotic coffee and mugs. Yeah. They're good bugs. Mugs. Uh, one use per customer. I'll try to let the chat. Oh, Eric, I can read those. the rest of it. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Gary's a forgetful dumb fuck. And we'll read all of this. Yes. Uh, Go also, fuck yourself, San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> Check out Instagram. Whale's vagina. Nerdrotic Instagram. There's a giveaway right now. There's a giveaway, I believe, once a month. Uh, and all you have to do is follow the account. So, yeah. Check it Schwag out. Swag Sunday. Swag Sunday. Get some swag. All right, uh, Steve Marvin for five dollars. Shad, can you please describe in great deal, great detail, the Mormon practice of soaking for the chat and the panel? I'm doing research for an independent short film. Soaking? I've never heard of that. Is this, is this a, a sexual those... thing? Is I this... think that's a sexual thing. I think somebody's trying to be funny, and maybe it was. Sorry, it was Steve oh. Marvin, not Steve Martin. So it's a little, uh, little less funny than Steve Martin. Maybe more fun. Is it like there know. are some weird practices that people who are not following the teachings of the church and here like that that can arise sometimes. And I wonder if it's one of those weird things. Uh, um, it's a yeah. like, like a meme thing. Meme. Is, okay. well, 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 just a, a point of reference because this is dumb. But some stupid, you know, young people in the church started doing this, and then the uh, the elders eating came down and said, "No, no, no." Oh. So. We practice the law of chastity. This is a very important thing in our church. No sex before marriage. And some young people who uh, were a bit too um, horny, for lack of a better word, basically says, well, you can put it in, but as long as you don't move, it's not breaking the law of chastity. Oh, my God. <laughs> and it's like, hey, no, no, <laughs> no. And I wonder if that's the term that they were using uh, to describe soaking. Um, okay. But okay. no, we like, and this wasn't prevalent, but it did come up and it's like, are you idiots? No, that is still breaking the law of chastity. So anyway. Yes. Uh, you should do an episode on uh, David Roll's new Egyptian chronology. Uh, chronology. His redating of several uh, reigns fixes a lot of issues with the archaeology and all but erases the Greek dark ages. Uh, Zahi Hawass would hate him. <laughs> then I probably like him. Alex M, thank you for the ten dollars piston for two euros. Says, but Gary, according to uh, to Doctor Who, the moon is an egg that gives birth to a fucking space dragon. That was a fucking terrible episode. Uh, the Happy Plague Doctor for ten dollars. Shad, just curious if you've come across the work of Terry Carter. He interviews a bunch of amateur Mormon archaeologists who run around in the mountains of Utah finding all kinds of crazy stuff. He Terry sounds Carter. familiar, but I'm, I, I, I'm familiar with some of these um, guys that are doing a lot of legwork in trying to uh, do archaeological research into the mound builders, talking to these tribes. And like when I mentioned about some of their traditional oral history, they mention like about like things that seem very clearly the visitation of Christ, the split between the Nephites and the Lamanites, and uh, that you know that there was a group of more fair-skinned people and, and all these things, and it's crazy. And and these are not like we're, we're, the Mormons aren't feeding them this mm -hmm. tradition of oral history that uh, they they just come out and they say it, like. There is a wild one in the video I shared with Gary about uh, a prophecy of the sewn up man that would come and teach them about the end. Yeah. Yeah. The, Jesus basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. The sewn up man, because he had a cloth 
covering his whole body except for his hands and uh from his and neck head. up he, mm-hmm. and and it was a thinner cloth yeah. wow. um listen because- another reason the smithsonian and the state fights really hard against any kind of possibility that something european look and we're not like talking about all blonde hair black uh, white guys uh but even greek or anything is because uh the nationalist socialist party uh and this is how graham hancock got called a, a white supremacist as well the nationalist really, yeah. socialist party used a lot of that to uh, to back up their their crazy occult claims um but um and that's that's why they fight it that's why they think they fight it but they most of why they fight it is because they want to keep their jobs they want to keep that narrative going um mm-hmm. and they hate religion you know yeah. uh like because they want to be the religion it's just like every other yeah. religion you mm-hmm. you go we are the only truth and we must destroy all other ones mm-hmm. that's what it's they like, do uh i mean i'm sure we have atheists listening right now got no problem with atheists at all mm-hmm. at, at all used to be one myself um but uh you know most of the atheists are like whatever they, you know they can believe what they want that's that's a normal person right mm-hmm. and then you get the dickheads on fucking youtube uh who come out there and they're just they're, they're the most hateful motherfuckers out yeah. there there's so much like religious and and political bigotry from them yeah. it's just repurposed bigotry yeah. that's all it is mm-hmm. uh it's yeah. like oh okay i'm glad you know the truth awesome for you uh you know but that's like running around going i hate pizza and making videos about how much you hate pizza mm-hmm. it's like mm-hmm. ah, okay oh you good. hate pizza all right good but remember you, gary they're the tolerant ones of yes course. yes mm-hmm. they're enlightened mm-hmm. of course uh, she, uh i read that one uh mormons practice polygamy here in salt lake i'm bountiful as a protestant pastor the local recycling business is a polygamy <laughs> uh polygamous family says robin swope for ten dollars there's a lot of weird right. shit well there are, they're not members of the uh, yeah Church they're not Jesus Christ, like I say. So these, there's yeah. fraction groups like this called fundamentalist mormons and stuff like that mm-hmm. that still want to practice polygamy oh, and things uh, but america, they're not they're not members of the church uh, my no. church, church of america Christ, is still filled with crazy fucking cults yeah like if anyone tries to practice polygamy and they're a member of the church they get excommunicated it's an yeah. excommunicatable oh, offense wow. um uh, yeah like we, we so yeah that's what i watched a ages. video about that yeah yep. and Go- remember like even a scripture, even doctrinal, even the Book of Mormon, it says very clearly, no, this is a sin unless very specific circumstances are in such a place where God will command it otherwise. Uh, outside of that, one man, one woman, that's the standard of marriage has been I'm, for thousands of years. I'm pretty sure the owner, I, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. This is just a speculation. I'm pretty sure the owner of uh, Skinwalker Ranch is Mormon. Or was oh yeah, or grew up in a Mormon family. Not Bigelow, but the uh, the the new one. Uh, no, it's Fugel, Brandon Fugel. Fugel. Yeah, the new oh. one. Who has the most insane nerd collection I've ever seen? It's beautiful. I just want to. I don't even want to go to Skinwalker Ranch. I want to see his collection. <laughs> I just want to want to look at his collection. It's insane. He's a big old nerd. Uh, Mormons are cute. Just don't get them wet or feed them after midnight. I cannot confirm or deny. They multiply. Uh, one last uh, <laughs> on last week, Bigfoot could have been a large woolly human uh, in an era of woolly megafauna, and was the only being capable of fighting off the cave bears and sloth, clearing a path for smaller humanoids. Says Jake Skywalker for nine ninety nine. Hey. Well, Y Files are good friends at the Y Files. Their last video was freaking about, so good. Uh, was about Neanderthals and how we might have misidentified them. We see them as. Uh, uh, you know, just larger brow, but kind of kindly looking. And they're like, no, the, the, they might have been like really scary, strong, like, uh, and, and hunted humans to extinction. Mm-hmm. Um, and then at the end, he's like, and that might have been what Bigfoot is. And Bigfoot might, like, if Bigfoot exists, it's some lost hominid that there's like 10 of in the world. Maybe. Sure. I Do think you know, it's a generational a... memory of that, of the, those fights. Oh, being afraid types. of the dark. Yeah. 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 Just on Bigfoot, there's a, a religious uh, speculation about this. This is not doctrine in oh? our church at all, but okay. there is some speculation as to who, like, because, so Cain, 
son of Adam murdered his brother Abel, you know, mm -hmm. one of, yeah. right? mm -hmm. he was cursed to be a vagabond and wanderer. Um, uh, and uh, one of the uh, doctrines we do believe is that Cain was cursed to never die. That is still wandering the earth today. Mm -hmm. And one of the uh, possible kind of speculations is that, all right, what's some of these sightings of the, you know, this man wandering the earth and stuff, you know, Holy big, crap. could this, could this mm -hmm. be Cain, you know, because mm -hmm. like we do believe Cain is still wandering the earth. So interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. You know, we don't know. We don't know. Um, Jake Skywalker, 499. My ancestors were Mormon. Uh, many went north to Utah, but they went to Texas to seek a life of religious freedom away from the feds. Yeah, I mean, like Utah's pretty base state, you know. I, it's like, to be. Uh, we try, I think, but I, I, I mean, alcohol sales stop it, and I think that still happens. Correct me if I'm wrong. At <laughs> I, nine I, I, I believe so. Yeah, yeah. Um, in Salt Lake City, but uh, but Texas, you can't buy alcohol mm -hmm. on Sundays. It's like really, yeah, really. That's so strange. Yeah. I mean, I could give a fuck. <laughs> well, yeah, but, but um, like it's the same kind of thing. Like, why do we, why does do it exist? You do dry January. I do dry one day at a time forever. Okay, so <laughs> uh, really, so if I wanted to get some booze at a, at a Circle K on Sunday and they sell it to you me, that's a hard do. liquor. Yeah. Oh, right. hard liquor. Yeah, liquor, liquor. liquor. Oh, okay. not beer. You can get beer, but not liquor. Like all the liquor stores are closed. You can't really, like you can't buy liquor toy, in almost. like a 7-Eleven. Uh, they don't have anything hard in there. Okay. Uh, not that I would ever notice. You want to you wanna hear some other fun Mormon kind oh, of speculation, which is not doctrine, but, you know, it's thrown around as a sure. maybe. Uh, so the birth of Christ was prophesied amongst the Nephites, like hundreds of years mm -hmm. before it actually happened. And they knew of the sign that would appear in the sky, the star and things. And there are a couple of prophets leading up to uh, the birth of Christ that uh, Samuel the Lamanite is one of them that disappear. And they're not heard of again, that they don't appear in the Book of Mormon record after some of the prophecies. And they're not around when Christ, you know, uh, dies and visits stuff. And this is complete speculation, but it's, it's, it's worth it. It's like, I wonder, right? Some wonder if the three wise men that came to visit Christ was actually some of these prophets that disappeared mm -hmm. uh, from the Americas because they wanted to see the birth of their savior. Because the three wise men are rumored to be two white and one black. And the prophets that disappeared Two would have been fair skinned. One have had dark skin, which is Samuel the Lamanite. And just look, it's not doctrine. We don't. And I, look, I probably don't think so. But it's just one of those things that speculation. That's just interesting. Speculation. To, to, to that would be cool. About. If it were, yeah, it would be very cool. It's like machicolation, but speculation. Speculation. <laughs> uh, Winter Wolf CR seven for ten dollars from Utah and raised Mormon. So great seeing all you talk about it on here. Also, Shad, are you coming to Dragon Steel Con this year? cool uh if any of you could make it what where's dragon steel con so dragon steel is brandon sanderson's convention that he holds um oh. I don't have any plans. is it in utah yeah. probably yeah uh, that's dragon steel 2024 is uh, it's in salt lake city utah november. Uh, how oh. how did i guess november 20th <laughs> and 20 maybe maybe i i, I do want to go up there I do want, well, we can't get anywhere near Skinwalker, cool. but um, there's other crazy, there's other, there's lots of fun stuff to see in, in Utah. Utah's pretty cool. You know? Yeah. I mean, I would love to go to Dragon Steel Con. Uh, I don't have any plans to at the moment. We got to get you to San Diego <laughs> Comic Con. Oh, dude, I know. I got, it'll happen. So fun. Yeah. Got to yeah, gotta come over. I don't know if I'm going to make San Diego Comic Con this year, <laughs> uh, but we'll see. Kind of close. Uh, I, I got to call him Monday. Cause I had to send in letterhead and sign it. And I'm like, I don't have time to sign it. I don't have time to press <laughs> like, uh, okay. You need to get a notoriety. My Photoshop stuff. is on my Mac, which is in that closet in the inner closet of a closet. So I had to within five minutes, pull out my Mac, set it up, get my Photoshop, scan that picture and then fucking sign it or email it to myself and sign it or just hey. give them one without the signature and go, you know, do you need a signature really uh, for asking me for a letterhead? For one. Yeah. What the? Uh, it's a 1994, guys. Okay. <laughs> Fax it to us. I don't even I, know Chris, what a letterhead Chris, is. Chris, Chris, Give us a Chris notification. Like, on your Chris was out there going, pilot. come on, man. I faked, my, I faked being a big media outlet for a long time. Just do it. I'm like, 
<laughs> I had five minutes. I, I like I had to I had to put it in. I had five minutes. I didn't have enough Made time. It. That's what. Just Do just on that note, <laughs> we're like here here at our business. Here, we're, yeah. we're in the process of launching three new websites to make everything look legitimate and one of them is the Shadim Brooks website and it like it's cringe but it's the corporate kind of thing where you have a picture of me standing kind of like oh and that's it do you have one yeah. of these ones <laughs> yeah yeah you know like, well, I, I, it's but that's what corporations when we're trying to look for sponsors and I'm like look this is our official company look how professional we are we, I, I, they, they uh, that and I'll never forget what I mean. Uh, well, it was during real BBC. Jeremy came in and we were just ripping the shit out of something. Jeremy's all, this is why we never get sponsorships. <laughs> Damn fucking right. <laughs> I don't want them. What's up, George? George. Oh, yeah, George. Hail, brother. George. Hail, brother. When we do like Greek stuff, we got to get George on. Yeah. yeah. Got to get George on. Uh, contrarian 420 for $5 says, does Shad accept the God that God transcended all description and concepts of man, whether Mormon or Hindu God is active present. This precedes any concept. I don't know the exact context of what I'm describing here. What I believe is that God actually reveals a portion of his truth to all of his children on earth. And then, and so I think there are prophets that he called amongst, you know, other cultures and everything that were legit called by him. And then usually human interpretation gets added to it and everything like that. But I actually think a lot of the, uh, you know, earth's religions come from a very authentic source because you see such parallels in doctrine and teachings. Like if you go into some of the deep, deep doctrine of our church as to the origin of God and the state of reality, it is some shocking parallels to Hinduism uh, and stuff like that. And, uh, and, and we've got some really awesome doctrine all about those things. And so there's that, but there are certain beliefs that, we, as uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Christianity, uh, sorry, as a Christian faith, break the mold on. Uh, for instance, we have a pretty explicit scripture that describes God not being able to do something, and it's that he cannot break his own law. Now, that explicitly describes that God has a limitation, which means doctrinally, we do not believe this sense that God is all-powerful and do everything. And that actually answers this uh, logical puzzle that people trying to challenge this of God proposes, when they, can God create a stone he cannot lift? Because the idea of God being all-powerful is actually a self-contradicting uh, philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, and our actual belief is that, no, God must, there must be a mechanism that explains God's existence. And if there is a mechanism that explains his existence, he therefore must be bound by it. And so the the idea that God must can do anything is a false <laughs> kind of uh, logic. Yeah. And it, we actually have that in our doctrine. We're probably one of the only Christian faiths in the world that acknowledges that God must have a limitation. He is a maximally <laughs> powerful. He is the he is the most maximal powerful being in existence. So the most power that any being can possibly have. But he can't be all powerful in the sense of doing everything. There has to be a mechanism that explains his existence. And one of the things that we believe is that he cannot break his own law. Um, and uh, to my knowledge, we're the only Christian faith that has that understanding in our core scripture and doctrine. Uh, and so that, because uh, I think that might be where some of the question might be indicating, questioning, do you believe about God it being, you know, well, does God transcend all human beliefs? I, I mean, that's what I believe, but uh, I mean, other people can uh, believe yeah. different. So. There's a hundred percent something there. Like back to the, why do we make these same kinds of ritual aspects? You know, it's like there's yeah. there's this well, it, idea of God like in a, everyone. Yeah, it's like defining a power power level in a character. Shad loves that. Mm -hmm. So uh, <laughs> if if God invented physics, he can't. And and we'll say God's the creator, the architects, physics, not what humans understand of it okay so say there's a there you know there's a code for the universe for lack of a better description can't break the code can't have a fish ride a bicycle you know just randomly you know uh so uh bananas won't start singing right before x-ray girl eats one while she's driving you know um but he if he acid. is outside of that code and created that code if then that's, maybe he that's where other, he is maybe there's a different code. yes maybe like he's super mm -hmm. omnipotent but different and, different rules you know, but different mm -hmm. rules yeah uh look up james strong the mormon pirate king of beaver island lake michigan 
I like I, everything I, about that. Yeah, that sounds great. I've never heard of it. <laughs> Vic Whiplash for $10. My name is James Strong, King of Beaver Island. Yeah. <laughs> uh cyberhunk 269 for $2 America was a melting pot before Columbus was here. I totally believe That's what that. it sounds like. Yep. Uh, skeptic in me is now less sure about anything in history than I was just five years ago. Thanks, Shad. This is Southeastern <laughs> Kaiju for five dollars. <laughs> right. Uh, you know what's funny is that skepticism could go both ways, brother. That's the whole thing. <laughs> it's a it, we are very we are skeptics of the modern paradigm. That's what we are. Uh, <laughs> I Nia C for six ninety nine says Gary ordered Hancock's books. Excited to read them. Oh man, you're in for a good journey. And then watch the show. I'm I'm about to rewatch the show. It's been it's been over a year. Oh yeah, since I've watched the show, so it's but time to rewatch. Mm -hmm. There are much better thick. Uh, they are much thicker than I was expecting. LOL. That's what she said. Oh. Um, <laughs> also, thanks for shouting out blue collar workers all the time. I was one. I was yeah, I absolutely one now. I can't, but um, uh, most of my life, I was a blue collar worker. Uh, you guys make the world go around. So, oh yeah, sip of coffee to the blue. We collar need world. you. <sighs> Gollum's half botch circumcision left over. <laughs> That's uh, makes sense. The Garani mythology share a lot with Gobek Gobekli Tepe hieroglyphics mm -hmm. look up the seven sons of tau and karena there's a lot yeah well and the handbags the freaking handbags they're everywhere that's weird that is really weird um shad can you elaborate on the description of the afterlife from a mormon uh inter is it interpretation and then it's iirc it had Something to do with planets we oversee, says Canis Dingus for $5. Well, this is one of the other things where uh, you could say Mormonism stands a little bit separate to standard Christianity because we believe we are the spirit children of God, okay? Which means spiritually we believe we're essentially the same race as God. And when God wants us to become like him, we do believe that quite literally. He wants us to become like him, to have all, to have all his happiness, when that's the state of exaltation, we believe the state of, of exaltation is Godhood to become like God and then to follow through the same path that God has followed to be able to then go on and achieve eternal glory and happiness by having spiritual children and putting them on the path to be able to obtain the same happiness and, you know, glory so you can have that your we own... hope to attain. Uh, no, well, planets, I think, is there uh, a too limiting kind of view. And I, I think members of the early church kind of viewed it that way. I almost perceive it as if you're going to actually obtain the status of godhood, like our God, you would have your own reality to be able to mold as you will, okay, um, and to be able to dwell in you know eternal happiness and. Glory. So then, how do you know that the, the God that you believe is the one God isn't one of those? You know what I mean? How do you know that you're not in one we, of those we, other realities? It's we like have the simulation on that. Well, well. Let me quote a scripture to you, and maybe I'll just let you mull it over. This is in the Doctrine and Covenants. And so this is a scripture that Jesus Christ gave to Joseph Smith. And it says, All truth is independent in that sphere in which God has placed it, to act for itself as all intelligence also. Otherwise, there is no existence. Well, it basically, like, over. there has to be truth. Otherwise, well, like, it would all just kind of crumble. Mm, like... We have doctrine that explains the fundamental framework of existence and the origin of God and intelligence, and it blows your mind when you start to wrap your head around this doctrine. We talked about crazy. this in the UK. We yeah, did. we did. We did. Yep. And it is yep. awesome. It is awesome. And it actually holds up from a secular logical kind of analysis about how yeah. could how, what how does reality frame together? And it gets down to the fundamental concept of uh, is our reality even material type of stuff and, yeah. and, hmm. and all that. It's good. Fun stuff. Fascinating. Arg, another name for nine 99. What was the, what was it? Pratchett said something like the new Testament is basically about what happened when God got religion. Uh, Cyber hunk 2069 for $2. What if uh, evolution itself is intelligently designed? Uh, I think it is. That's what I think yeah. Well, not only that, there is indication in Genesis that points to that, right? So 
God, he created Adam from the dust of the earth. Now, there are mm. interpretations on that. And one of the interpretations is that of the dust of the earth can mean a metaphorical type of, you know, you know, evolutionary birth, right? But if God literally formed Adam from like clay dust of the earth, why didn't he make Adam in the garden? The account is very clear. He made Adam and then picked him up and placed him in the garden. Why did God yep. need to place Adam in the garden of Eden if he literally constructed him from the raw materials? He could have just done it in the garden of Eden, no. but instead Adam was created first and then needed to be placed in the garden. Now, if you take the evolutionary perspective that God used evolution to uh, bring about the formation of the first man, which would be Adam, yeah, first man that was born, that's Adam, bang, pick him up, in the garden yeah. you go. First one that and, came out and had a fully formed mm -hmm. brain that yep. could perceive mm -hmm. reality yep. and be sentient. Yep. He went, all right, that's Adam. Boom. And that, that's just one reference, let alone the um, fact that the path of creation as laid out in Genesis follows the evolutionary path. That first you need water and then you need the sea creatures and then you need, and it, yeah. follows, it follows the same pattern of creation. And so, yeah, I think evolution fits very neatly into intelligent design and even biblical understanding of creation and for and because i'm I'm okay with like it could be either <laughs> like god hasn't revealed this is exactly it and so it doesn't bother me either way it could be straight creation or he could have used intelligent design through evolution it fits yeah. both don't here let me just share something for you So that little medical symbol, the snake, you know, yeah, uh, it's it's fucking found in Egypt and in ancient Greece. Uh, there's also I couldn't find it, but I know I've seen it. There's also uh, s stuff written uh, in hieroglyphs that look like DNA symbols. It looks like the DNA. Yeah. Yeah. Weird. Yeah. It's weird. It's awfully strange. All right. We've got to get through this. Yep. George Giant Slayers get to five neurotic live memberships for twenty five dollars. Hail George. <laughs> Okay. Thank you, George. Love you, brother. James Crawford for $10. Hey, Gary. Hey, hell, Gary. I wrote a book in 2017 where conspiracy theories are true, mainly about giants. Geneva's uh, Convention by Diego Paladin. I'll check it out. Well, a lot of conspiracy theories have come true since 2017. <laughs> so you are a prophet. Yeah. Are you a historian? Uh, medieval, uh, uh, medieval syphilis has donated $5. Do you think uh, most aliens will be anatomically similar to us or completely? incomprehensible completely incomprehensible yeah. really i wonder if convergent evolution might actually be a more no i think there's a outcome. human race that is throughout the galaxy bipedal. but i think other aliens we can't see some are big blue light some look like floating jellyfish yeah yeah uh, well, uh fucking octopus might be fucking alien just like the difference yeah. of animals that we see might on, be alien on like, the planet earth like we have a vast amount mm. of different ways animals have uh, mm -hmm. are, are formed right the well, way they walk the way they can't eat, even understand the they, yeah I, i'm like, open to that would it not be different i think it's possible but i also think the most optimal form for intelligent life to really break through some important barriers on in this planet of, mm. maybe so on, a, yeah, I, on a planet like earth a bipedal uh uh like uh, humanoid, you know, form, humanoid, humanoid form humanoid form that can hold things in its hands so it doesn't yeah. have to walk on the hands yes and a yeah, maybe brain. on a planet Tools. that has heavier gravity or is in a what different atmosphere. Or, or, yeah. Or, yeah. What doesn't make a lot of sense is we have a lot of back problems. There's a, we, don't, we don't have a lot of hair. Dude, my knees are Our killing babies me. like take forever, forever to grow to up and are, are defenseless. There's a lot of things that just don't like don't pass the sniff test of us surviving. Uh, <laughs> well, I, 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 We're um, definitely just saying, set apart. I'm just saying. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, they uh, uh watch that Y files video, you know, like there's no way we should have we should have survived down to 50, down to 50 uh, individuals. By the way, I do want to say, I do believe in aliens. I actually, in, in fact, uh, we have scripture that confirms aliens exist in, in the book of Moses, oh. which is a translation from um, from Joseph Smith. He revealed the book of Moses, and in that, God literally says that the worlds and planets are populated. Specifically, though, he says, with begotten sons and daughters of God. The Book of Enoch. It's Enoch? apocryphal. But uh, the Book of Enoch, uh, that's some crazy shit. 
Yeah, but uh, for it's, it's funny. So Mormons actually have doctrine saying aliens exist. It's a scripture, actual scripture. They ju we just believe that they are children, begotten children, sons and daughters of God. It doesn't confirm what they look like. It indicates they do that would be their humanoid of some type. But you know, well, there are some that are humanoid. There's some yeah. that aren't, uh, like gaseous plasma or telekinetic species. Absolutely, interdimensional species. I was watching Skinwalker Ranch last night, kind of going through season four again. And uh, the best thing in the whole thing was the when the helicopter was flying over and they were doing a completely different experiment and they caught the the UIP fly into the Mesa and out of the Mesa. Oh, yeah. It, yeah. That was fucking weird. That was cool. And that is something that's happened unless they completely faked it. And if they did that, then their show's fucked. Their show's fucked if they did that. Um, Alex Waddington for $10. I love a healthy discussion that has uh opposing sides thank you fellowship for staying friendly always staying friendly no, no? Yeah. that's the thing I, I don't get that i don't get like i am not a christian i'm not uh but i'm not going to be against them why what's the point what am i fighting about i'm like, christian oh, and i'm not against your religion Mormonism. tells I'm you to just, do I'm nice things to people uh nice things you might well, yes some of our beliefs will differ so what mm -hmm. I don't care. That doesn't, it's not, none of them are deal breakers for me, unless yeah. it's like, you know, hey, we we really need to enslave people. It's like, ah, you know, I'm not down with that. I'm not, <laughs> yeah, that's a deal breaker. That. But um, yeah, yeah uh, uh, otherwise, you know, whatever. Uh, uh, I, I I don't. My wife and I don't see eye to eye on, on a lot of stuff, so <laughs> it's it's possible. It's it's the internet that makes it seem impossible, but it's not. Uh, it's a Gundam yep. played his demo on his last stream, minute demo. 47 and on. The one he played on FNT a while back. Uh, quarter, you say it. Careful. Uh, what? Uh, quarter me. And then... oh. Sorry for trying to hack your PC. We good? And that's yeah, it's good. It's okay. Gollum's half botched circumcision left over. Uh, flatline for five British pounds, proper money. Uh, Mormonism isn't the only story of the golden books uh, of the Americas. There's a story of a whole library under a mountain in Ecuador. Yeah, yeah. Yes, there is. Yeah, that's what I was referring to. That's it. Well, that yeah. is interesting because, yeah. I mean, the account of where the gold plates ended up was in a, basically a library of records. Uh, and that's, and that's there is a library returns. of records in Ecuador. Oh. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Supposedly. Uh, Judah for $10. Um, ancient Hebrew language and Japanese have a lot in common. So too is how religious leaders dress. At some point, they drifted away. You can compare ancient Judaism to other cultures worldwide. There's also a connection. God, I, I'm going to. There is a connection with uh, South Pacific language. And I want to say Hinduism, which kind of makes sense. You know, uh, I can't. I can't remember exactly. I'll, I'll, I'll look it up someday. I, I read so much stuff and it's so scattered that I don't remember it all well. But uh, uh, well, the happy. Oh, go just, ahead. On, just on how I was saying, you know, it seems like uh, these Jewish practices appearing all over the place. Remember, there's a direct account of the House of Israel being scattered. Greek. It was Greek. Thank you, chat. Not Hinduism. Oh, it was Greek. It was Greek. Mm. And Sorry. It, go on. Oh, no, yeah, it's just, it's not necessarily a Jewish religion. It's the ancient Israelite religion. And it's just the Jews was the one tribe that kind of survived and stayed in, in Jerusalem. Um, but no, ancient Israelite practice, it, it appears in multiple places. And yeah, Israel was scattered. And so you can see mm -hmm. happening. And, and the Book of Mormon is just one of the accounts of one of those scattered people that was of the tribe of Joseph. Uh, the Happy Plague Doctor for $10 says, what's the plan for the eclipse? I got my camper van kitted out uh i got my welding goggles uh i have uh so the plan for the eclipse i i don't know if you have to sign i guess you have to sign snake up snake bros, bros. Yeah, yeah you have to yeah. sign up for it uh and send me the link is i hope it's not sold out uh i will send it to you send me the link yeah uh the plan is uh for me and garrett garrett should go you should bring your family yeah, you should make, yeah. a day, make a day out fun. of it and go camping and the plan is to go and see uh, Ben and the Snake Bros. What, 70 days till then? Yep, oh, 70 days. Oh, yeah, 70 days. I'm bummed. I can't go uh, to Egypt with Ben. I wanted to <sighs> I really bad, but uh, unforeseen life circumstances. So um, we'll do it next year. We'll just go with it with him next year. 
uh, the gaming angel for four ninety nine. As my fellow LDS, I I was uh, I was like LSD would be me, but LDS <laughs> would be Shad. I yes. appreciate this stream. Latter Day Saints. There you go. Uh, Astari Azul for one ninety nine. I'd love to get Bon Jovi. Oh, John Levy. Why did I say Bon Jovi? Because it's in my <laughs> it's head. It's on your head. Dan Vask is in your head. It. He's in my head. John Levy and Robert Seffer on, but not Bon Jovi. Fuck that no. guy. Uh, Crypto Kev. Hail chat. Gary, are you going to the eclipse in the canyon in April? Yes. Three day camp and music with Snake Bros and Ben in Utopia, Texas, barring a civil war, of course. A uh, civil war is not going <laughs> to stop it. That's not going to. Yeah, Civil War's down on the border. That's like 150 miles away, 200 miles away from me, and like 500 miles away from Garrett. So Yeah, we good. It's not going to happen. I think the closest border point to me is like 130 miles. Yeah, I used to live, at some point, 30 miles away from the border. So, uh, Big E or Big E1312 for $10. Uh, how can you say... JS translation, the GPs, when he rarely referenced them, JS used a rock he found while digging as well. He put it in a hat, covered his face with the hat, and dictated the book. Yeah, That's a I used the year because he had no formal education. And so we believe that he uh, translated the Book of Mormon through the gift and power of God by the use of the Urim and Thummim. By the way, Urim and Thummim, that's biblical. Okay. It appears like it's referenced in the Bible what these are. They're seeing stones. And we believe that he, so uh, traditionally, how you'd use these seeing stones, you'd put the Urim and Thummim into a type of, you know, uh, bowl, um, vessel of some kind, and then peer into it. And so Joseph, he used a hat. It's like, hey, well, this this works the same thing. And so he put him in a hat and he would gaze into it and get the translation. The thing is, though, to confirm that he would copy, he, he to confirm that the translation was accurate, he copied down the characters from the Book of Mormon and then put the translation underneath it, sent it to Egyptologists, and they confirmed that it was an accurate translation. Mm. And it signed off on it. And that, that bit of paper is still there. Those characters that I showed before is literally that. that. Those are the characters he copied over from it. And by the way, to also confirm that the Book of Mormon is a translation, right? It translates back into Hebrew near perfectly. You know those chiasmic verses that we went through? Okay. Yeah. Some of those chiasmic verses only actually work when they're translated back into Hebrew. They're not fully oh. chiasmic in English. Okay. But when you translate it back into Hebrew, they are they are perfect chiasmic structure, which is the Hebrew rhetoric style. All right. And so if people could attack the Book of Mormon for not being an ancient Hebrew kind of text, they would have been doing for eight. Like it, like when they try that, it holds up to that mm. scrutiny. The the from the names, the names are Hebrew, and the, the, there's practices, then the just the sentence structure and style of language, it, it translates back perfect. And so mm. it's pretty solid really solid that the book of mormon is in well the language is ancient hebrew remember it was written in reformed egyptian but that's been tested and been confirmed um as for it being a, an authentic translation of an ancient text people will still try and fight it but when they fight it these references come up and they can't be refuted they're like that's it right there wow that's it uh we have oh, da, 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 we got a few more here, so we got to get through these. This is a classic Art Bell level stuff. Kudos, says Southeastern Kaiju for two dollars. By the way, that reminds Thank me you. Of what I just that's plugged into the computer. Uh, that's very, that was the highest of praise. I meant to wear my Art Bell shirt today and didn't. Um, I have a bunch of Art Bell on uh, a thumb drive that I just plugged in that I'll be sharing with you and Adam. And yes. Next ray goes. Yes. Uh, it'll be on the drive. You'll have it tonight. It's a lot of good shit. Sweet. Uh, yeah, I'm excited. Listening about material that. for the road trip. Oh, yes. forever for the rest of your life. <laughs> I'm driving uh, there and back. So yeah, I go watch uh, two episodes. There and back again. <laughs> there and back again. Yes, 16 hour drive for me. Yep. About the same. About the same. Three yep. hour flight. Yeah. Good luck with that. Hope you're not flying yeah. a 737 Boeing. You know. Max. falls apart in the sky and i hope you're i'll check, uh, you the, have, I'll check the pilots yeah i hope yeah, you have the most them. diverse Make crew sure by the uh, way. toxic masculine you yes know, men. aaron bacon for five british pounds doesn't the writer's journey have happen to cross where they're suddenly building these very big projects such as the line fully contained city etc 
The writer's journey? It said the writer's journey. Doesn't the writer's journey happen to cross where they are suddenly building these very big projects such as the line, fully contained city, etc.? That's I do not understand. I don't know what that, that's in reference to. It's probably earlier. If Aaron, if you're in the chat, mm -hmm. let us know what's just mm -hmm. pop in a chat. Garrett will see it. Yeah. Entry girl will see it. And uh, we'll respond to it. Sorry about that. Bear beard whiskers for ten dollars. As a sto as a stoic, I try to apply all good things in my life. Kudos to Shad for having more balls than some I've met. We are in this together, no matter the differences. Yep. Cheers, man. Cheers. Cyberpunk 2069 for ten dollars. All animals that fly have wings. Most that swim have fins. Organisms that live in the same medium adopt the same strategies. I would uh, not be surprised if the same were true of the medium of uh, sentience. Yeah, I mean, as above, so below. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I totally. Uh, divine revelations happen. After a near-death experience, my dad woke up writing physics equations about sacred geometry. God moves in mysterious ways. Since Jake Skywalker, 499. Yes. It does. Like, near... There, you can look into some uh, like collections of near death experiences, and they are wild, insane. Like, yeah, like, yeah, oh boy. And you know, again, science doesn't like to talk about these things because they can't be explained. But no, there's like they... accounts out of body experiences where people literally look down the hallway from their hospital room, see things, they wake up, describe what they should not have visibly yeah. been able to see. And I like, and there are multiple accounts of this stuff happening. All the dudes who you know go into a coma come out and speak fluent mandarin never yeah, spoken what, what is before. that, that would uh, be insane. uh or kid prodigies who are just born being able to play the fucking piano like so <laughs> yeah. so there is some record that you get access to that's at the minimum that's what it is at the very yeah. minimum there is some backup drive that like you hit your head hard enough like, or you're born the, with the right oh. chemistry that you get access to and like oh shit i can like totally play the piano <laughs> Well, that has something to do like with the idea of consciousness not being within our heads, but being yes, more of like we're a radio and we're picking it up. Yeah. Yep. It's yeah, like see, we uh, we can access some other channel. We switch over for a second, switch back and go, hey, yeah. I know Mandarin. I mean, like from my religious perspective, I believe we lived with God as spirits before we came to Earth and we mm. passed through a veil, which now blocks off those memories. But we actually have memories and knowledge of our past pre-earth life that we don't have now but sometimes i believe we can poke through the veil or that veil is lifted in certain areas and we might actually like get access to memories knowledge things there's, like that there's and, definitely some people who have that it's very interesting talking to my mother on like the chinese medicine aspect and there's there's some interesting things that she said to me and i'm like how would you know that but she does through like meditation what? and whatnot, whatnot. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's uh, people who are just intuitive. There's straight up psychics. There's ESP. Yeah, it's all out there. Uh, government remote viewing happened, dude. Remote happened. viewing is the craziest stuff, man. Yeah. You got to look into that. Like I, that I, is that where you, where they take drugs and they test if they no. Can see stuff? No, no. So that was yeah, that was something completely different. You know, the man who stare at goats. Yes. The movie. I've heard of it. Yeah, yeah, I've heard of it. So this is the actual. It was was it CIA mm -hmm. that ran that? CIA that program? ran the program out of Silicon Valley, basically. And it's yeah. where you you sit down and, and somebody that can do it. Uh, you, supposedly anybody could do it, uh, but the guy that was doing it would not be told where the location is or any information about it, and be they just go, hey, we need to know about this base, and they would just come up with okay there's a mountain there's a ridge line here and here's where three buildings are and then there's a satellite dish and then they would independently verify the things that that guy said and and confirm it <laughs> and like they, they did it multiple yeah. different ways and it was like i mean that's wild and how? like yeah I get annoyed when people get so locked down into the materialist view of reality that our reality is just the material world. When to me, there are so many, like, like what you described out of body experiences there, there are signs of a metaphysical reality that is pretty stark. If yeah. you just pay attention and listen to what people have experienced, it's full on. It, it's yeah. Yeah. Uh, Eric K for two hours mounds. No, it is all about almond joy. I'll give it to you, Eric, but 
kick you for that joke, kind of <laughs> joke. <laughs> nah. A uh, single guy cooking for $5 went to Zion National Park years ago, had a decent beer. It was called Polygamy Porter. <laughs> uh, Joseph Benowitz for five dollars. Expedition Bigfoot captured a shadow of a bipedal figure walking in full shine uh flashlight when it disappeared on camera. Idea interdimensional cloaking. I want to see that. I want to see that. I want to see yeah. that vidya. Uh Golem's half botched circumcision leftover for ten thousand uh PYGs, whatever that is. Uh we'll say golem uh pesos. Look up Pombero and Maboy 2E. 2E. T U apostrophe A-T-U. I. My boy 2E. My boy 2E. What what is it? I mean, you just tell us look what it, is. it could be porn. It could be like Polynesian <laughs> porn. Like, what are you talking about? What are you talking careful, about? Careful, careful looking Tui. things up. <laughs> oh, uh, it it's like a, a hobbit. Giant serpent. It looks uh, a hobbit. My boy 2E. Uh, no, it looks like the little hobbit thing. A god of mischief. It's a god of mischief. Did you look know. up the po- the first one, the Pomboru? Pombero? Yeah, I, I looked like up the Pomboro. It's oh, like the I looked things. I looked the other one. Yeah, uh, the other it's one like is a, a serpent weird god. Weird creature, yeah. dark, golemy looking. That's no way to talk about comics division. I think that's mean. Okay. <laughs> Terra Galaxy uh, filaments and human brain synopsis. Yes, there. Um, as above, so below. There's a lot of. Well, you know, there's fucking spirals everywhere across the world. Drawn spirals. And it could be from a lot of things. Could they identify galaxies? Or was it uh, something they saw in the sky? Was it plasma from, uh, you know, uh, like a Carrington event? Who knows? Is it a portal? Or people just like to draw spirals. It's like, ooh, these are pretty. I like these. It's clearly a weather balloon. Uh, weather balloon. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm weather balloon. Weather balloon. Uh, uh-huh. Mad dog three seven five. This last one of the night for two dollars. Oh, I read oh, that I one read already. That, yeah. We done. Oh. We done. Oh, we done. Thanks everybody. <laughs> By the way, guys, it's gonna take uh, thirty minutes to upload one part. So yeah, it'd be about an hour for you to do it. We we can start like once in a while going over a classic Art Bell episode. Dude, hell yes, that's a great yeah. idea. We kind of did it. that with Father Malachi. That was kind we, of what we, we did there. Yeah, we did, but we need to do like Art Bell. Like he doesn't get a art. Classic episode. Ancient Aliens, yeah. Graham Hancock, Randall Carlson, uh, Richard Dolan, uh, everything you see, George Knapp, every fucking thing you see is because of Art Bell. Mm-hmm. Art Bell. Art yeah, I'd love Bell. to do that. That that would be pioneer. And, and he gets Great. no fucking love because George Norrie hated him. So, uh, and he's back in the Gaia, but like, how come there hasn't been a documentary on Art Bell? Like a legit documentary. Yeah. Bob Lazar. None of this fucking, like George Knapp was around Bob Lazar, but Art Bell boosted it. Art Bell had the biggest program. You'll see other people who still, uh, acknowledge Art Bell will go like Art Bell boosted it. Like he, like he had the second biggest syndication in the world, radio syndication in the world when he was at his peak if not the biggest uh and uh you know multiple countries and by the way as soon as george norrie took over it was halved immediately so nothing was ever uh i don't think Ru- rush limbaugh wasn't his uh might have really? i think he might have he might have been the only one in more places than art bell i was gonna say yeah, rush was huge rush was huge but art was international yeah art was international so uh one more super chat just came in all right yeah, the Y Files does shout out, shout out Art Bell. That's why the Y Files is fucking cool. That's why they awesome. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd love to go through that and do like a Art Bell learning session. That'd be really fun. Yeah. Do you want uh, to read it or you want to read that? I'll read it. The LDS are the biggest example of why 2A is so important. When the state of Ohio called for an extermination of the Mormons, they ultimately had to fight their way to the West. Great people, glad to call them family. The sharp for 10 Canadian pesos. There you go. So you, yeah. have you guys heard of that? The Mormon extermination order? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. So mm-hmm. someone reported a false quote by Joseph Smith to the governor. And it was a, a skewing of something along the lines where Joseph Smith said, if um, any state troop or something came in and threatened my family, I'd shoot him or something like that. Whereas uh, oh. saying something to defend his family based, 
but then they said that you know he was threatening you know the state authority that you know the mormons were going to insurrect and uprise and so uh, governor boggs said that the mormons must be considered enemies of the state and driven from the state and they signed an extermination order where it was legal for anyone to murder a mormon kill a mormon what? yeah yeah yep. Uh, and it wasn't rescinded Mormons. until the 70s. <laughs> it wasn't rescinded what? until 1976. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. That's insane. That's insane. Uh, t t you weren't allowed to kill a Mormon in 1975, okay? But, um, <laughs> like, you, you weren't. Uh, there's a lot of... They just forgot they about just, it. They were like, they oh, just many laws. They they just, yeah, they just didn't feel like it was important to, like, maybe we should rescind the law that makes it legal to kill a Mormon. I think it's you know? still a death penalty if you steal a horse in Texas. I don't know if that's a fact, <laughs> yeah, but I think th it is. There right. are some it is crazy here. laws that are still on the books. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> don't steal a fucking horse, man. Don't do it. And by the way, it, like the guy who said the, the misquote, he admitted later on that it was all a friggin' lie, like it was all made up. Uh, and so it was all trumped up charges because then he had like an open arrest warrant in certain states. And that's what led to his ultimate murder, Joseph Smith's murder in Carthage jail, mm -hmm. where they had an arrest warrant based on false allegations. And to save, uh, you know, many of the saints, uh, the early Latter day Saints, um, basically getting attacked and stuff he willingly submitted himself to um to that and he was held in carthage uh, yeah in liberty jail uh or carthage i can't why am i getting those mixed up shame on me but yeah he was uh, an angry mob stormed the jail and murdered him and uh, and his brother seized. right and his brother hiram smith yep wow. beautiful great story <laughs> one more as carthage Carthage. Inter interesting. It was Carthage. Interesting. That's the name of the town. Yeah. Yeah, he was held in Liberty Jail. Was a different jail that it was held in at one yeah. time, for uh, like months at a time. Check out Testament Brotherhood of the Snake. Brotherhood of the Snake. We like the uh, Brotherhood of the Serpent too. The Snake Brothers. Thanks, Joseph. The good dudes. Yeah. Good dudes. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Shad and Brooks. What do you got coming up, pal? Oh, so there's a plushie available. Um, that, yeah. that's that thing. And uh, Shadow Versity videos, like the last video we did on Shadow, hey, hell of a lot of fun. Where we're testing how to have, uh, if we can re reproduce freeing Lazel from Baldur's Gate 3. And crazy thing, like we, we do some crazy stuff with that video. So that's it's fun. <laughs> um, and didn't the same old stuff? I'm getting by, but guys, thanks heaps for having me on. Thanks for letting me nerd out about something I don't get to talk about online very much. This has been awesome. <laughs> Dude, thanks. I love it. It was fascinating. It was really cool uh, hearing all that. All that, uh, like, some of the things, like, really made things sound like they're, they're like, it's a real mm -hmm. artifact that he found. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Yeah. wow. A lot of uh, comparisons, and it almost was like chilly to see the similarities across different think things. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So, um, I don't know if Gary's still there, but uh I'm still here. Okay. <laughs> I'm marvel I'm marveling at a meme right now. Okay. <laughs> I am still here. <laughs> Chad, thanks for coming on, man. Uh X-ray sure. girl. Did you say what what do you have? Uh on? no, but I'm gonna be on Simpcast after this, uh on Chrissy's channel, and then tomorrow I'm gonna be watching another episode of Doctor Who and Torchwood, and then reviewing it on my channel this week with Zia. So uh check oh. that out at 6 p.m. Eastern. Simcast, huh? So yeah. uh, what are we talking about tonight? Buttholes or plastic surgery? Uh, right. I'm looking at their live stream right now, and then they're looking at Chrissy getting patted down at the um Okay. Or feeling up pregnant women. Okay. That's yeah. different. Um, <laughs> all right. Maybe maybe plastic surgery on your butthole. Maybe you can just maybe. like combine it. No, it's always about buttholes. Yeah. It's all the, the buttholes will be brought up. Uh, <laughs> Garrett, what do you hey. got coming up? Uh, tomorrow, Bay Staff Monday on Adam's channel, and right after that, I've started streaming on my channel, just playing Robocop. It's been a lot of fun, so that, and then Normal World Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I'm not going to be there, but you can still watch it. Uh, I'm going to be on my way to Orlando, Orlando for Megacon, so if you're in the area, go. Go to uh, Megacon. There's also awesome. a meetup, sign up. 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. Saturday yeah. on City Walk Geeks somewhere. Geeksandgamers.com where you can find that RSVP? Yes, uh, most likely. A lot of information is on the Geeks I and Gamers website. I could drop it right now. Yeah. 
So at I'll seven o'clock at some place that sounds like a strip joint. Um, at uh, Red Coconut on, on Club. Oh yeah, it does. <laughs> Maybe it is. I don't know. It's 21 and up. Remember, yeah, remember tell people it's 21 and up. Yeah, so 21 if any, and up. any littles come, there's an overflow area, which quite frankly, I'll probably be in more than the actual bar. But um, so uh yeah, I'll, I'll come out and hang out right. with the with the sweet. Eric's already got it, people. but I also with, don't oh, oh Eric's way ahead. Like yeah, I shouldn't even said that. Sorry. He put Eric. it in there like a million times already. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Eric's use like, that RSVP like, link. Way ahead of you, dumb Let shit. us know. Gosh. Let us know. Uh, and that's exactly what he says to us, and I'm okay with it. Um, so, uh, and uh, yeah, it's going to be lots of fun. Uh, uh, we got a panel at 1:30 at MegaCon. I will be at the Garrett X-ray Girl and I. Uh, I think separate, same times. Not sure. Uh, sometime after the panel, we'll be at the table, Ripperverse table. I'm going to be there. Time. I'm going to just be there at the same time. It's just easier. It's you know I like same it this time. way. So we don't have to coordinate this one. So I'm just kind of, I'll go where we're here for the ride. Going. We Yay. just go along with the flow. You know, <laughs> Vegas will be announced as soon as we get back. Cause we yeah. have, we have it laid out already. Yep. It's already, yeah. yep. it's already ready to go. We're just waiting to announce it. Um, I can tell you it's during the week of CinemaCon If you want to make your plans and, and most of the stuff we're doing, if not all is during the week. Uh, yeah. that makes it, I know it makes it a little harder for you to get time off, but it makes it cheaper. So there's a little bit of a trade off there and a little less crowded. Yeah. So, we like um, that. we like that. We like that. We're going to have lots of fun. Can't is wait. NASCAR there that week too? Fuck. Is it? God damn it. Well, here's the deal though. Like you I have three, ev- you have three events in, in Vegas. You would not be able to tell you would not. One of the biggest, one of the, I, I don't think it is now, but 20 years ago, the biggest convention in the country was the rodeo convention in Vegas. It was insane. Really? Uh, you couldn't tell it was there. So, um, unfortunately, in Orlando, there's a Pro Bowl. There's a cheerleading tournament. There's MegaCon. There's a lot of shit going on. And hey. there's Universal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. And, on top and, of that. And, be full. And, and I guess to a lesser extent, that stupid Disney place. But, um, <laughs> yeah. So we'll see you there. Thanks, everybody. One more. One more. Uh, seriously, look up the Seven Sons of Tao and Karena. You'll find lots of familiar faces with weird personalities changed after 1500s. Oh, wow. Seven you, Sons. That, that number seven coming up again. Yeah. Seven Sages, Seven Sons. Seven Sons. Seven Son of the Seventh Son. Seven Son of the Seventh Son. Come on, Iron Maiden. Let's go. <laughs> All disappoint me. <laughs> okay, now we're going to go. <laughs> <laughs> See you later. Uh, Catch Welcome, travelers, to the fringes of reality, where the strange and mysterious meet, and the thin veil between fact and fiction is torn. <laughs> Welcome to the Forbidden Frontier.